December. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have our just before the fall of Africa, and we're here. So just read it. Okay. We've already explained to all the international folks what the language is. Okay. So you can just. Hang on, just a sec. Just. So welcome folks to, to again back to, to Victoria College. So glad that Mike brought students from the Jackman Humanities Institute summer program. Um, I did one of those last year. It was one of the truly great experiences in my teaching career. And so we can trust them as being brilliant. Um, and and again, this is the sorry, you've done it, you've done it too, right? Oh, fantastic. And Greetings to our Zoom participants, John and Wong from uh, Rhode Island. So um, I, this is the uh, Northern Pride Center, which um, the, our, the director of the center, Bob Davidson is actually away, um, has met you folks in, in Bologna, he's away in Epic Census. Greetings to pass along this morning. And this of course is, is, is the center itself, which is, a kind of humanities, cultural studies center, and a very good partner with Gil and Aria um, here on this campus. I do not miss the opportunity to see North of Pride's typewriter. I am told, learned that he actually came to Toronto to take part in a typing contest. <laughs> um, but let me pass this to Amber with greetings to all of you folks, including those online, to Amber for, for a land acknowledgement. Okay, um, yes, my name is Amber. I'm, I used to be a part of culinary in Phoenix City. I'm not currently, but um, I am a, so yes, sorry. Uh, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. There's also an intro comedy session after this that we said you have to So uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you all to this third day of um, this wonderful conference that is um, forming the partnership between Culinaria and Bologna. And I'm very sorry to say I'm sorry. And Amsterdam. And Amsterdam. <clears throat> you may not know this yet. Um, so I'm not Dan Bender, I'm sorry to say. Um, my name is Lisa Haushofer. I'm uh, currently a senior research associate at the University of Zurich, and I'm about to uh, move to Amsterdam and then um, hopefully uh, persuade you all to sort of make Amsterdam part of this but triangle. But that's that, why you're chairing today. Um, so um i yeah i have the very great pleasure of chairing this session especially because i have been a postdoc at culinaria which has um let's admit it been the the happiest two years of my career and i'm very very excited particularly about this um session because it is the culinary round table on new directions in food studies and i have to say i've been so um just thrilled the last two days to um you know just really to take in what what um you've all built here at culinaria and it feels like such an exciting um, place to be and it feels like the place to be where the future of food studies is really uh, taking place and I'm very excited about this ongoing um, partnership you're developing with Bologna. Um, so it's my honor to introduce um, the first speaker of our roundtable this morning, Dr. Michael Klassens, um, uh, who I've been a, a long-term fan of as well as the other panelists on, on this panel. Um, he's an assistant professor at the School of the Environment of um, the environment at the University of Toronto, and he's going to talk to us about the campus turn in sustainable food studies. Great, thanks so much. Um, first off, let me just thank, I want to thank the organizers. This is, of course, uh, academic labor that we don't often acknowledge. Uh, I, I, I don't think any sense we should. So thanks to all the organizers. I know this is a tremendous amount of work to pull all this together. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about briefly today is yeah what I've been calling the campus turn in food systems scholarship advocacy and activism. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about what I see kind of happening on campuses across North America, 
And really it's about students sometimes in partnership with faculty and staff, sort of prefiguring solutions to the, the fundamental and existential crises of the, 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 you know, the compounding crisis of, of social and ecological uh, disaster that we're facing um, within the context, of course, of ongoing racial capitalism and colonialism. Uh, you know, it, there was this famous book, of course, with the preeminent social change theorists uh, and thinkers, Miles Horton and Paolo Freire, uh, called We Make the Road by Walking. Uh, and I think that in, in many cases, students are making the university by walking at the moment. And it's really inspiring that we need to, if we're thinking about, you know, new directions in food system scholarship, we need to be focusing on, of course, the context within which this work is happening, which is, of course, the academy. Um, so I want to start by giving a bit of framing in terms of how I think about this context within which we're all working in the context within which, in fact, this very conference is happening. Uh, so, of course, the stakes for food systems and broader social transformation couldn't really be higher, the colliding impacts of climate change, corporate concentration, geopolitical instability, etc., have deepened the long-standing social inequity and ecological unsustainability of the capital-intensive and industrialized food system. Uh, IPE has recently said that without concerted and immediate action to re relocalize, diversify, and decommodify food systems, we're, quote, sleepwalking into the catastrophic systemic food crises of the future. Pretty stark. At the same time, of course, universities are under attack, and the, the extent to which they can address this poly crisis, I think, is being undermined. Alan Sears' classic work, a friend and colleague at TMU, of course, already 20 years old, uh, documented in, uh, the kind of rationalization of colleges and universities. Moves to tailor education solely to the, mar you know, the market economy, uh, the rise of reductive outcome measures for student faculty evaluation, and the commercialization of knowledge more broadly, the pursuit of uh, efficiencies in the post-secondary sector, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, have all served to undermine and, and, and you know, precaritize academic labor. In Ontario, of course, we've seen this through the introduction of the strategic mandate agreements, uh, again, which index post-secondary funding to an increasingly sort of instrumentalized set of performance metrics. Next slide, please. But that's not all. Um, <laughs> more recently, of course, we're seeing something else happening on campuses, I think. On the left side of the screen here, you see text from a bill recently introduced by Ohio Republicans that would effectively block universities from taking a stance on or even teaching about so-called controversial beliefs or policies, among which include climate change, diversity, equity, and inclusion. On the right side of the screen, you see part of a so-called fact sheet issued by Ron DeSantis, a Republican governor of Florida, of course. And this provides a summary of his recent overhaul of post-secondary education in the state. These include changes that require universities to, quote, not promote ideological indoctrination and prohibit university from adopting DEI policies and even teaching about DEI. Last week, DeSantis uh, suggested to, that students who want to learn about, quote, woke subjects uh, to leave the state and go to Berkeley, he said. <laughs> Which, who doesn't want to go to Berkeley? <laughs> uh, he said, quote, for our tax dollars, we want to focus on the classical mission of what a university is supposed to be. What's happening in Florida and Ohio is also happening in Texas, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Idaho, North Dakota, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Kansas, and other red states at the moment. <clears throat> Again, I think that these conditions, both the kind of corporatization of the university, but also what we're seeing, I think, is a kind of fascistic kind of creep into university spaces, presents a, a kind of, a, you know, a real challenge for the work that we want to do here. The question is whether or not we can even do the kind of work that we want to do. So I think that these developments suggest a new wave of efforts to shape colleges and universities and the role they play in broader society in ways that depart dramatically and dangerously from simple corporatization and neoliberalization of the campus. And this is a dangerous ideological project. And of course, at the same time, though, it demonstrates how important even those of the radical right understand colleges and universities to be in the broader processes of the kind of social reproduction that we do here. So this all, I think, suggests that we can that we should uh, take very seriously the work that we're doing on campus and the kinds of work that we're supporting and protect this space. And I think that students are actually at the forefront of this work. That's kind of the main point that I want to make today. And of course, this isn't anything new. Uh, young students have been key actors in every significant social movement since at least the post-war period. However, the, the history of student activism goes well beyond this to even the 17th century when students organized for a better curriculum, lodging, and food. 
Much more recently, of course, students have continued to mobilize for more equitable and uh, inclusive education policies while waging resistance against the ongoing new neoliberalization of higher education. Of course, coincident with the rise of the new left, student activism substantively shaped the political and countercultural projects of the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, the campus environment more generally was intertwined with the radical politics of the area, including, of course, the Chicana Chicana movements, the Black Power movement, the Students for Democratic Society, and others. <clears throat> In other words, student activism has a long precedent of being significantly oriented beyond campus, aimed at addressing and responding to a range of social, political, economic, and environmental issues in wider society. Uh, and of course, in the contemporary context, we've seen students uh, centrally important to a range of movements with impact well beyond campus from the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter movement, through to queer activism and, uh, and others. And of course, uh, students are at the center of a reinvigorated climate politics that are reshaping post-secondary institutions uh, and indeed the world. Uh, look no further than just out this literal door, uh, where uh, students organizing with Climate Justice U of T organized an 18 day occupation of this, of this space right outside here uh, that contributed to this college committing to divesting from fossil fuels by 2030. Uh, so again, we see that students have a significant impact on our institutions. <clears throat> now to pivot, uh, that was a very long introduction. I had very little to do with food study. I apologize for that. But I think it's important framing context for, for this, this work that we've been doing. <clears throat> um, so in terms of scholarship focused on capturing the ways uh, that campus actors are pursuing food systems change, uh, I think that we can sort of conceptualize these within these kind of three buckets of procurement, production, and pedagogy. And I think these are important to focus on, but I also think that we're missing some of the kinds of activities uh, that are going on on campus if we only focus on these. So this is what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. Uh, so, of course, um, as large institutions that purchase significant quantities of food, one important way is that campuses can and do shape food systems is through alternative procurement initiatives. So at the moment, food services, of course, on most campuses are controlled by a small, a small number of for-profit transnational corporations, including Compass Group, Aramark, and Sodexo, uh, at least here in North America. Uh, in some cases, campuses have a kind of uh, mixed food model, uh, partly operated by the institution and partly contracted out. But in aggregate, about 70% of food services across this country uh, are, are operated by one of those three uh, corporate giants. And these companies, of course, are notorious for a variety of practices that undermine the pursuit of more just and sustainable food systems from providing energy dense, nutrient poor foods through exerting downward pressure on labor costs. Uh, so these big three corporate food uh, service providers uh, are really the primary expression of the globalized corporate industrialized food system on our campuses. Of course, there's been various attempts, even in this, even at this very institution, to uh, to develop alternative kinds of procurement models. Uh, these have had sort of mixed uh, mixed impact, and uh, you know, but we continue to see them sort of bubble from 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 time to time. Uh, in terms of production. Uh, so of course, the Morrill Land Grant Act originally enacted in 1862, established the, the land grant university system in the US. And this is a central piece, of course, of the federal government's plan to encourage post-secondary institutions to quote, teach such branches of learning as relate to agriculture and the mechanical arts. Over the course of the past century and a half, these post-secondary farms have supported uh, practical teaching and learning and support largely of the corporate again, industrialized agricultural regime. In more recent years, though, there's been a, uh, a rapid increase in the growth of different kinds of food growing spaces on campuses across North America. And this is some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, in the US, for example, uh, the number of these kind of alternative growing spaces on campus increased from 23 in 1992 to an estimated 300 uh, by 2016. Our research shows there's probably about 120 of these campus food growing spaces in Canada. Um, and these are uh, provide a different kind of paradigm for, for agriculture production on campus and also agricultural education uh, than, than what do the kind of conventional agricultural education of the, of the very la large land grant universities. Speed up a little bit now. I feel I won't get through everything. I think so. <clears throat> 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, critical food systems pedagogy. So until relatively recently, food pedagogy is an area of formal study was relatively underappreciated. Jennifer Sumner here, a colleague at OAC at U of T, uh, very concisely put it just in 2016 that those who study learning have not often turned their gaze towards food, uh, while those who study food have generally overlooked the learning associated with it. But as scholars began to turn a critical eye on food systems pedagogy, many have found that the associated teaching, teaching and learning as it exists on the whole to be somewhat problematic. Um, Jordan and colleagues, for example, find that conventional learning about food systems is relatively narrow in scope and kind of unduly beholden to disciplinary boundaries and abstracted from the broader economic, cultural, and political conditions which sort of underpin our food systems. And so even food systems pedagogy until relatively recently was fairly problematic and served to kind of underscore and reinforce the corporatized industrialized food system that we're actually, I think, all pretty invested in seeing fundamentally changed. Uh, next slide. Um, so just very quickly, this is a kind of uh, conceptual model that we created to sort of demonstrate the kinds of interventions that are happening on campus. I won't have time to sort of get into this uh, too much, but uh, and, I, I apologize if this is a shameless plug, but actually this piece just came out in the Journal of Agriculture, Food Systems and Community Development just today. Uh, so you can find it there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you can read more there. I'll, I'll, so I'll just move on. Just wanna highlight a couple of distinctive features of, of what we've been calling campus food systems alternatives. Uh, two points here in particular, I just wanna underscore quickly. Uh, the first is governance and leadership. So. Importantly, many of these initiatives are student-led, uh, uh, often funded through uh, student unions, student levies, et cetera. Uh, they're often very, they have commitments to sort of collaboration and non-hierarchical uh, ways of organizing. Um, sometimes organized as social enterprise, often as nonprofits. Uh, and then also they espouse explicit commitments uh, to socio-ecological change. So uh, these oft this often sort of manifests as prioritizing student needs. And of course, we know that among those student food insecurity is particularly acute and growing on campuses across North America. Um, uh, they prioritize things like community, uh, network building, using food as an organizing tool, not just food as you know, sustenance. Um, they focus on, you know, have commitments again to justice and equity, uh, decolonization, uh, evolution. These kinds of things, again, which might seem to some as being, you know, only very sort of tangentially connected to, to food systems, but again, I think many people in this room recognize that actually these things are implicitly uh, part of, of all the food systems uh, discussions. I think that we have either, yeah, in the in the foreground or in the background. Uh, just a couple of examples here: uh, People's Potato at Concordia at Concordia University and the Lower Ladle. Um, at uh, Dowsey, um, so you, you can just see some of the language that these student groups use to sort of describe the kinds of work that they're doing. Uh, and again, importantly, um, you know, they have explicit commitments to, again, capitalism, colonization, these kinds of things. And again, this is students who are leading this work on campus. And I really, again, think uh, doing some inspiring work that I think can, can sort of inform the kind of work that we do to, you know, as, as faculty, uh, junior faculty, senior faculty, grad students, et cetera. To kind of support this work, uh, just very very quickly, I want to skip ahead to, to two more. Yeah, um, we have some students here. Uh, I've cribbed a couple of the, <laughs> a couple of their slides from a presentation um, uh, that I've been working with in the context of, of the Jackman Humanities uh, Scholars Residence Program, and they have actually been doing some of this work, uh, prefiguring. Uh, you know, the potential for a zero waste anti-capitalist cafe on campus. So we've been doing some work to, to organize this over the last month or so. And again, really, really inspiring work. Uh, praxis is a, is a thing that I've just been sort of blurting out throughout the last month and, and just randomly. Uh, but I think that's really important. Yesterday we built some garden beds and put some soil in them and, you know, did these kinds of things. Um, and I should probably end there, it's the last slide. Uh, I'll just give a shout out to uh, Sophia Sriba and Caitlin Adam who are, uh, students that I wrote this, the paper that I just mentioned uh, with. Uh, and then also a shout out to Tamara, uh, Diego, Amelia, Jatsna, and Amber who are here. And then of course, Nicole Spiegelar and Evelyn Diego who, uh, who we've been sort of uh, co-supervising uh, these students as a group. Uh, so I think I'm out of time. Thanks very much. Uh, really Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, so next up is Dr. Nino Barriola, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Culinary Research Center. And he's going to talk to us about sea to table biological and social sciences in the study of sustainable seafood in the global south. Can you just find out if the Zoom people can hear properly? Yeah. We need to move to all this. Right, right, right. Um, so uh, I, I guess I don't know. I don't know. Uh, not in the chat. Yeah, I think. yeah we just asked Joe to yeah. put it in the chat. <coughs> Once we know things. Yeah. So is there a question? Can everyone? Yeah, just it? ask them if they're okay because sometimes a little bit of adjustment is necessary. You can see if you have those paper programs, if you can pass them around for the people who are not curious. Yeah, they're over, they're over, right? Yeah, right. Those there. if you can just oh, yeah, Marty. <laughs> And same with the just let me know we can keep your speakers. Sometimes workshops and conferences are like, I know you want to give you a video, they can talk with you. Never happens, so let's make that Okay, yes. And let me just get the news. I'm going to give you a minute warning. Shut up, warning. I have my journey panel. I'm just going to introduce you again. That's okay. Yeah. But I was in the school and the former international visiting student who's in Uppsala University. Okay. Um, so just because it was a little bit loud uh, when I introduced you, uh, so let me do that again. So uh, I'm very Happy to welcome Dr. Nino Variola, who is a postdoctoral fellow here at the Culinaria Research Center. And he's going to talk to us about sea to table biological and social sciences in the study of sustainable seafood in the global south. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. And thanks, everyone. Um, title has changed a bit because now it's like more in the article, kind of like vibe, but the spirit of trying to like um, highlight how we can collaborate more between. Uh, natural sciences and social science humanities, like it's kind of like the spirit of, uh, of this project. So um, it is such a delight to be here. I only arrived in Toronto uh, not so long ago. So this is my first uh, presentation as part of the Culinaria family. So I'm really excited to share this work that I'll be you know, trying to, to, to pull through uh, in the next few months. Um, there's still a preliminary finding, so I very much welcome your, your feedback, your criticisms, uh, mean and not so mean, uh, so please, um, uh, about methods, about, you know, the findings, etc. cetera. Um, um, this is, uh, this is uh, oh, I also want to acknowledge my uh, brilliant co-author, Daniela Biffi, uh, from the Texas Christian University, TCU, uh, who is joining us uh, via Zoom. Um, so this is, uh, again, preliminary findings of research that Daniela and I have been conducting. This is uh, actually our very first presentation of the outputs of this project. Um, and uh, I wanted to start by sharing how the project was, uh, was, was conceived. Sorry? Uh, Daniela just uh, smiled at us. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's very Daniela, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, um, as I have uh, many times discussed with, with that, that vendor here, one limitation uh, of uh, North American food studies, and I wonder if our Italian colleagues can say the same about their own experiences, is, um, is whether uh, there is actual dialogue between the humanities, social sciences within food studies and the natural sciences. And I believe there's, uh, you know, not so much. And uh, when it is, there is mostly focused in agricultural studies and 
an agroecology and not so much uh, beyond. Um, so, uh, you know, I think this is an example of what, how we can foster those things, even if they occur serendipitously, they never can pronounce that word correctly. Um, so as this mean tries to convey, uh, you know, they're quite, you know, distant perspectives sometimes in how uh, social scientists on the one hand and, uh, and um, natural scientists on the other, or real scientists, if you will, on the other see uh, the, the role of research. And, uh, and I even would say that the social science one is kind of like objectivist and not, not postmodern enough. And I would, I would say something that, you know, we should even admit that, you know, reality is a social construct and that uh, it should be adjusted to, to admin in, in, in Bordeauxian fashion that, uh, that actually we should like, you know, change the structures that structure the way in which people socially construct uh, what they think is reality. So, um, Please excuse the, the word you and me here. Uh, can we go to the next uh, slide? So as some of you know, my research interests lie at the intersection of food, nationalism, race, and labor. Uh, my now book project, formerly my dissertation, uh, now done, um, uh, aims to provide insights as to how formerly uh, racially uh, and marginalized, uh, stigmatized and marginalized forms of culture, including so-called ethnic foods, uh, become consecrated and highly appreciated for elite audiences and by uh, food experts like, um, you know, high-end chefs like Ferran Adria and the like. Um, so that video, for example, was sharing that the not so long ago he saw in Palermo a fancy Peruvian restaurant that called his attention. And that's exactly my point. The food served at that restaurant are foods that when I was a kid not so long ago um, were, were, were frowned upon. We're not seen as uh, as cool foods, as foods that you know we should like propagandize as as a whole year. And now, if, if if one of you has been through in the last fifteen years or so, these are the first thing that you know a taxi driver speaks about. You know, like have you tried ceviche yet? Um. So my question is, how do uh, you know formerly marginalized foods? Um, uh, managed to enter Michelin star restaurants like, you know, the one you see Vicha here is from uh, it's Pacta, a restaurant by Albert Adria and Ferran Adria, you know, the famous uh, owners of El Bulli, who was uh, by many years considered the best restaurant in the world. So how do Peruvian food managers to get there? Now, on the other hand, Daniela studies more important things, right? Can we go to the next slide? Uh, Daniela, besides studying Otters and other beautiful and cute uh, marine species uh, study seafood piracy and mislabeling. Uh, using sophisticated DNA measuring methods to trace whether what supermarkets and other venues say, say it's, for example, sole or flounder is actually that species or other kinds of species. Um, so, Daniela and her colleagues published this important paper in Nature Scientific Reports in 2020, and I read it. Uh, just because I'm uh, an omnivorous reader. And I, you know, I knew of her, we have friends in common where we had never met. Reach out to her and said like, this is really cool research, uh, let's get in touch. And that's how our collaboration and our friendship like started. Um, so uh, we spent a lot of time, you know, kind of like uh, briefing about like how to bring our stuff together. And, uh, you know, we figured out that a lot of the places where she had done tests uh, for her study were actually places where I had done interviews with the chefs. Mm -hmm. and, and in my interview um, uh, questionnaire, I, I included questions about sustainability that were really not at the forefront of my dissertation, but I had the data, right? So we decided to bring together our data uh, next. And, uh, and um, we decided to focus on whether in places like Peru, uh, where gastronomy has such an important uh, prominence, such an important industry, um, the restaurant industry was actually able to promote uh, sustainable seafood. Uh, we wanted to explore, to interrogate whether restaurants that were embracing, uh, you know, kind of like a, um, um, uh, an ethos of being sustainable and trying to make the consumers also appreciate sustainability of re sea resources, how, how are they doing? How do chefs and consumers perceive uh, sustainability and sustainability specifically, uh, and whether what they were actually serving 
you know, was actually sustainable or not. Um, so we believe, next please, these are really important questions because, um, you know, for the last 20 years, we've been uh, hearing from important instances uh, such as the UN that one way to fight food insecurity is to actually like focus on sea resources, right? That sea resources are a, an important uh, source of, uh, of alternative protein that, you know, can be potentially less, less uh, threatening to the environment than, uh, uh, than beef uh, uh, and pork and other uh, protein-based uh, uh, eats. At the same time, we have, uh, you know, increasing evidence that we're depleting seafood uh, res uh, sea uh, resources and that we're facing important environmental problems pertaining to the sea, right? So in the global north, there are uh, some um, mechanisms, private and public partnerships, state governance that allow uh, consumers to have a sense of whether what they're consuming is relatively sustainable or not. There are some, uh, there's uh, some trust that can allow um, consumers to perceive uh, whether their resources that they're consuming are actually traceable and whether, um, and whether, uh, and they use uh, relatively effectively according to some of the research on this um, mechanisms of labeling, right? In the global south, we lack this type of strategy. So we have left to the market the idea whether, you know, uh, what we consume is actually sustainable or not. We're only informed by the very people that provide this, uh, these uh, foods uh, the information whether the, the resources that they're using are sustainable or not. So um, given this gap, given that we know little about how seafood sustainability operates in the global south, we thought that by um, looking at these restaurants in uh, you know, this highly uh, eminent um, industry, we, we could like bring some insight into that. Um, so next please. So we brought together our data in a kind of like wacky, you know, sort of a juggly way. Uh, I had a large documentary corpus of newspaper articles and, uh, and um, documents from the government. And Daniela also had documents uh, from NGOs and other state organizations. Uh, so we, you know, scrapped all that documentation to look for social meaning. So basically what does um, seafood sustainability or a sustainable seafood mean uh, and some associated categories like catch of the day, for example, what do they mean uh, in this context? We also had uh, my interviews with, uh, with chefs. Um, these um, interviews provide also ideas about social uh, meaning uh, of these uh, um, uh, key terms, uh, but also justifications and narratives. Narratives provide uh, what socially is called causal tradition, like why people do what they do. Uh, and we know that that's often justification and not selling motivation, right? Like there's like ways in which people rationalize their uh, actions post facto, but that's still interesting data because it, it allows us to see what, uh, what, the, what the chefs deem um, uh, ideal, what they deem that is, uh, that is uh, preferable, even if they in the end do not deliver in those terms. And we also had uh, one uh, round of DNA tests that Daniela had already um, um, uh, gathered from the previous research. And we did another one uh, last year and we just got the results in. So this is uh, what, uh, very exciting. Next, please. Um, so I'm gonna share some of the findings. Thanks. Uh, oh, can we go back? This is one of the ways in which restaurants tell themselves as being sustainable, right? They put the fish right in front of you they tell you which fish it is and often where it comes from here with the very name of the fisherman that got it, uh, even when it's not really a sustainable species, like cheetah is actually like a quite, you know, depleted species. Um, uh, so, but this is one of the ways in which restaurants in the very built environment convey the sense that you're eating something that is, uh, that is uh, uh, sustainable, healthy, and good for you, right? Uh, next. Um, so here's some of the family, the Wittgensteinian family of meanings that we see in our documentation. So sustainable uh, seafood is associated with uh, being uh, related to abundant species, to species that um, uh, are abundant because they haven't been the focus of previous, uh, previous extraction. 
Um, they're often also seen or deemed as nutritious and healthy species. Um, often they're uh, thought to be uh, caught with non-industrial gear, non-industrial uh, methods of, uh, of uh, collection. Um, uh, a very important point that is often, you know, very much emphasized in the in the um, in the um, in many campaigns, they should be beyond uh, the minimum size. Uh, talla minima, as we say in Spanish, um, and they should not be in close season. Close season, also called bedas, I'm sure this is also like common in other places like in Italy, means when the fishes are reproducing themselves. So we should not bother them because uh, that's when they, that's where harvesting the fish would be most damaging for the species. Um, the very specific category of, of catch of the day, uh, of course, it's not separate, like it's uh, more an instance of sustainable seafood. Uh, is often deemed to be fresh, though what fresh means is, uh, you know, interesting. Uh, it's like a, a, a legend in Peru that you should not eat uh, seafood and particularly ceviche in, at night. Uh, and, you know, obviously the fish that is used to, uh, you know, make your ceviche is not fish that very morning, in, <laughs> you know, in most cases, but, you know, there's like um, a, a veil of, you know, delicious ignorance that uh, makes Peruvians eat only ceviche during the day. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually quite hard to find uh, ceviche at night, uh, even at fancy restaurants. Mm -hmm. Catch of the day is often, often uh, more affordable because again, it's like related to like um, um, species that are less desired. Uh, so we cannot be overfish uh, species like flounder, uh, <coughs> cheetah, as we saw, you know, um, and uh, could be maki maki, bonito, caballa, another. Uh, ideally, should be a uh, bluefish or black meat fish uh, instead of white, uh, among others. So this is like a, to give you a sense of the social meanings. Next, please. Um, here we have our results for the first uh, for the first round of DNA tests, and, and let me help you parse this quickly. Uh, we have in green the fine dining restaurants, and in pink or whatever that color is, uh, casual, smart casual, you know, restaurants. We did not uh, the test of uh, lowbrow restaurants because those uh, do not tell themselves as uh, you know doing sustainable uh, and, uh, and and according to previous research we know already that they buy already um, cut fish in pieces so it's impossible to like actually know uh, so by default that's not sustainable right uh, that's the ways in which you hide uh, fish that actually come from uh, smaller you know species and, and so. So, um, as you can see here, 29 out of our uh, 51 samples were mislabeled. So about 50% uh, of sustainable seafood or sustainable fish was actually a sustainable fish. Um, we see actually that mislabeling, of course, both at the fine dining restaurants and at the casual restaurants. So it's not that you know fine dining restaurants care more by any means. They might care more or actually perform similarly in the end. Uh, when we say they're mislabeled, we say that what they say they're serving is actually not what they say is serving. Uh, often the species that they're serving are species that are actually endangered, uh, but what we're able to measure is the fact that uh, they're not the fish that they claim they're serving. The, the sustainable, um, uh, allegedly sustainable restaurants tell you where you're, you know, you're eating Lisa today, you're eating flounder today, or well, Flounder is not like it's an over, you know, extracted species, but uh, they should tell you you're not eating flounder, and actually that's what you're eating. Things like that, right? That's what we're capturing uh, here. Next, uh, here we have our second round, uh, which uh, you know we're looking at specific restaurants that say that they're serving um, fish that's catch of the day, and we see here similarly that out of eighteen samples. Uh, nine, so 50% uh, are, are not what they say they serve. Um, so, uh, can we go next? So, um, these are some of the justifications that the, the chefs provide. Basically, um, some of them say that it's just really hard. Uh, this re this uh, uh, interview, by the way, were uh, gathered before the day, so I was not able to like decompress with them and tell you, like, buddy, you're actually, you know. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, but you know, in a lot of our of, of our uh, of our interviews, they share just like how really hard it is like without the help of the government that 
that tells you, well, this is actually how you do, how, how they regulate the extraction of fish. It's really hard for them to, to know, just like know uh, what they're getting from, from purveyors. Uh, we have noticed that the ones that really show deeper knowledge of the sea are the ones that are more often than not, uh, not mislabeling their fish. Um, so that's one key driver. Uh, and we often find that the ones that have less rosy discourses about sustainability are actually the ones that serve uh, uh, more sustainable fish uh, so far. Um, so just to wrap up quickly, uh, can we go to the last one? Um, our DNA test showed that practices aiming to promote sustainable seafood consumption in 50 to 50 per, uh, 57 percent of instances fail to comply with the intended goal of serving specific species that are deemed sustainable. But these tests by themselves, so what biologists can tell us, uh, fall short of providing an explanation of why this happens and what are the conditions that could allow us to overcome this, uh, this uh, type of, uh, of dissonance or failure. Um, insights from qualitative uh, analysis provide um, ideas as to uh, what are the conditions that could allow policies, uh, policies and programs promoted by NGO and market actors to operate well, to actually function, to actually fulfill their experiences. Uh, I don't know what the chefs say is that, yeah, we try to serve X species, but we say it's flounder because that's what the clients want. That's what they really are willing to pay. So how these motivations that try to in, uh, in um, uh, organizations like restaurants that are always precarious financially, how do chefs try to do sustainability, but also manage um, uh, financially precarious organization? How do they try to do that? Um, I think is where we're trying to uh, you know, get on here. So anyway, looking forward to your feedback. Thank you so much. Sorry, sir. so much so next up we have uh just refilling his his fuel water bottle for the talk dr noah ellison who is a postdoctoral fellow at the culinary research center um, and he's going to talk to us about sidewalk toil as performance of insurgent citizenship thank you also and thank you everyone for having me today um i must um warn you that i'm a bit under the weather so i may be coughing through this talk, for which um, I apologize. <coughs> um, one second here. So <clears throat> um, the um, aim of today's uh, presentation um, is to illustrate um, research that lives at the intersection of two domains of intersectional or um, interdisciplinary scholarship that I engage, which is uh, urban studies and food studies. and. Um, the research that I'm going to be talking about today um, has been uh, adapted from a chapter of my dissertation, which I was able to complete uh, with the support of uh, culinaria. And my dissertation um, generally sought to understand what food practices uh, reveal about the, the social, the spatial, and the political dynamics of multi-group settlements uh, in Queens, New York. And as we talked about the last few days, of course, those, the, 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 the political, the social, the cultural, they, they certainly overlap. Um, yet today, um, I'm going to be focusing uh, on primarily the political. Um, do you mind giving that? Yeah. <laughs> ah, so as I said, um, this research is focused on uh, Queens, New York. And I particularly focus on Queens, New York, uh, given its um, social heterogeneity since the, the 1965 Immigration Act that brought um, swarms of migrants from Latin America and uh, Asia, and um, that fundamentally changed the characteristics of New York City writ large. However, a lot of those uh, groups ended up um, uh, residing in, in Queens, particularly here in Northwestern Queens. Um, so much so that um, city demographers um, began to label this section of Queens as the most socially diverse or culturally diverse um, urban areas uh, in the United States. Um, and while several neighborhoods comprise these socially heterogeneous concentrations, um, the research that I'm focusing on today centers 
um, at an intersection at the center. Um, that is Roosevelt Avenue that you can see here in um, 82nd Street. So this intersection simultaneously bifurcates and connects two neighborhoods, which is uh, Elmhurst to the south and Jackson Heights to the north. So I focus on the sidewalks lining these intersections for two reasons. Um, the first is because they facilitate street food practices. Um, and while there may be a licensed vendor or two, the majority of the street food practices that operate on the sidewalks are unlicensed um, vendors without requisite city permits. Um, these vendors are exclusively women and they primarily come from uh, Mexico and South America. And as you can see here in, uh, in more pictures to come, they rely on shopping carts, plastic crates, water coolers, beverage jugs, and colorful umbrellas uh, to produce comestibles. And in this case, primarily steamed tamales, grilled corn, grilled meats uh, to feed Queens uh, public. And the second reason I focus on the intersection is because it is part of a business improvement district in which I'm going to refer to here as it. Um, for, for folks who live in Toronto, you may be familiar with business improvement associations or BIAs. These are essentially the same thing. And BIA has actually started um, in Toronto and were diffused to cities um, uh, uh, at large. And what they, they're essentially not for profit organizations um, governed by a board of directors composed of local property owners, um, uh, commercial tenants, and community leaders. And they partner with the city with the aim to promote uh, the district's uh, brick and mortar businesses and forms of economic development. So given the, um, the vendors um, working at this intersection and the, uh, the, the, um, the business improvement district, the intersection becomes a prime location to make sense of Queens multi-group populations varying values, but also its residents and workers sense of belonging. Next slide, please. So to highlight this project's conceptual contribution, I want to briefly discuss how a political anthropologist conceptualizes citizenship. Um, so James Holston argues that traditional notions of citizenship, which has been discussed in the past few days at the symposium, um, that is membership between individuals uh, and states are inadequate for understanding the complexities of urban life. In other words, contemporary understandings of citizenship reveal that, so uh, that sovereign states do not contain all things political and that, and that political communities exist outside the formal state apparatus. So for instance, in many cities, people's um, sense of belonging and identity are not tied to national borders, but instead to specific neighborhoods and communities where they live and work. Holston refers to the political participation as well as the cultural and social practices that enable individuals and groups to participate fully in city life as urban citizenship. However, in contrast to urban citizenship, Holston contends that marginalized and excluded groups in the city who assert their rights and claims to citizenship through direct action and resistance are processes of insurgent citizenship. Okay. By examining grassroots mobilizations and everyday practices that oppose state planning agendas in Brazil, Holston shows that marginalized people perform their rights and accept their new positionality as rights possessing citizens. Since people's sense of belonging is not only a right that occurs with legal status or physical presence, but instead of, on people's actions, Engen Eisen contends that citizenship is materialized through performances uh, and behaviors. So, so the research that I'm talking about today um, offers new citizenship perspectives by showing how unlicensed food vendors perform insurgent citizenship, not by fighting the state as Holson showed, but through spatial struggles against licensed food vendors and the business improvement district. And in the two case studies that I'm gonna go into in just a second, citizenship is not created by imposing pro-immigrant policy from above. Instead, it is a result of asserting rights and claims to urban spaces through food practices. Focusing on the experience of one operation particularly illustrates how an unlicensed vendor asserts political belonging, whether permitted to or not. 
So Donna, we could see here in both pictures on the right, um, came to Queens from Mexico just, be turned the turn, just before the turn of the 20th century. Like many inter international migrants before her, she struggled to secure work in a formal labor market. In order to maintain her livelihood, Donna began peddling food on the street. And her chance of securing the requisite city authorizations to sell food was nearly impossible. Donna nevertheless took to the streets without the required documents, subjecting herself to the litany of regulations that make her work extraordinarily challenging. Recognizing an area near the 82nd Street subway station, mainly used by passing pedestrians, she began temporarily adopting the sidewalk space from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m., grilling chuzos and elotes. Using a shopping cart for this operation allowed her to transport her wares from her home but the ubiquitous cart also enabled her to conveniently <coughs> store, organize, cook, and display her comestibles, as you can see here. Located underneath the staircase from the elevated subway tracks, the, the area of sidewalk she began using protected her from the elements and put her on display to thousands of customers. As a result, Donna continues working in the exact location, drizzling skewered meats with barbecue and hot sauces, and slathering corn and mayonnaise before covering it with crumbled cheese and sprinkling it with chili powder. Donna, a mother who only speaks Spanish, has had many interactions with aggressive pedestrians, members of the bid, the city's health department, and police officers. As a vulnerable person at risk, these enforcers threaten Donna's livelihood. Yet, over the years, she has learned to navigate the risk imposed by these enforcers through trial and error, and also through engaging engaging and observing the other, the, the tactics of the other vendors in the area. Although municipal enforcers are one of Donna's most significant threats by performing political acts of agency over the public sphere, that is the sidewalk, Donna can ward off other potential dangers, such as more secure vendors with license. For instance, on a Tuesday morning in 2018, a large lime green stainless steel mobile kitchen was parked in Donna's coveted spot. The licensed vendors serving grilled chicken, beef, and lamb over rice barely fit underneath the staircase, requiring substantially more sidewalk space than the unlicensed carts. When Donna and her assistant arrived at the intersection to find their spot taken, the duo immediately confronted the vendor. Donna's assistant verbally attacked the operator, arguing that the space belongs to Donna because she's been claiming it for 20 years. Operating with the requisite permits, the Latinx halal vendor was undiscouraged by such remarks. Although hostile words exchanged back and forth, it was not until Donna's assistant threatened to hit her that the Latinx vendor called the police. The halal vendor told the police that the unlicensed vendors had physically assaulted her. Donna and her assistant told the officers, quote, that they wanted to hit her, but they didn't want to go to jail, so they never did. The unlicensed vendors were let off with, without fines, but consequently were told to take a walk, which means to leave for the rest of the day. Reclaiming the same spot the following day in a revanchist spirit, Donna and her assistant confronted the halal vendor again. They, they then, after um, going into verbal assaults, they then deterred customers from purchasing food from the operation by telling passersby that their spot was stolen by this operator. As, an, uh, as a licensed vendor claimed the space for the same purpose as the other vendors, that is to make a living and to feed their family. Encounters with informal vendors interrupted her business, making it an unsustainable space to operate. After two days of claiming Donna's corner, the halal cart ceased to operate at the intersection. Instead, they set up shop on a nearby corner with less foot traffic. Later, the halal vendor told me that her boss, a Greek man who lives in another part of the borough, hired her to operate at the intersection because he, she speaks Spanish. She did not anticipate her job would create tensions between other Spanish speaking vendors and was, and was relieved to operate elsewhere. Now, Donna's account reveals that food practices in Queens multi-group neighborhoods empower some of the city's most vulnerable populations, that is racialized immigrant women. Although Donna is unauthorized to work on the streets, much less in the United States, she nevertheless exercises the right that legal citizens um, with requisite municipal permits have by hawking food on the sidewalks and is there subject to the municipal regulations imposed by citizens. 
Furthermore, Donna's spatial contestation exemplifies her claim to a right to the city, again, reserved for those with formal membership who hold mandatory city certifications. These processes show how undocumented individuals selling food on the street are performative practices of insurgent citizenship. However, this uh, vignette only illustrates one perspective of citizenship occurring at this intersection. Uh, next, I quickly want to show how an organization performs um, membership by using these vendors to resist commercial development proposed by the bid. So the grassroots organization uh, called Queens Neighborhood United, which I'm referring to here as QNU, was founded by residents who identify as immigrant women of color. Their aim is to establish control over land by tackling issues that affect businesses and residents related to policing and immigration in Queens. In 2017, the bid announced new plans for a movie theater that sits adjacent to where Donna and the unlicensed vendors operate. The slate, uh, it was slated to become 160,000 square foot mixed use development and was to include 120 residential units um, on top of the target. And for those unfamiliar, target is the United States' um, eighth largest retailer. QNU thus saw this project as a potential to displace um, the, uh, um, the vendors. Um, and uh, they also uh, saw the vendors uh, like themselves, who are many of which are undocumented, as part of their community. Um, they, they uh, thank you. They um, seen the vendors as they, as part of their community. Um, they uh, see the private developers um, and the organizations that plan and advocate for projects uh, that that they believe have the potential for displacement, like the bid, um, as outsiders. So, um, and one of the reasons that they see the bid as outsiders is over the past decade, the bid has attracted many chain retailers, such as Banana Republic, Gap, Old Navy, to occupy the storefronts along this intersection. And a key way the bid entices such unlicensed vendors, or un un uh, uh, entices such businesses is through streetscape beautification enhancements. As such, the presence of unlicensed vendors threatened the bid's ability to generate economic activities that advance interests of the property owners. And just as the bid sees the vendors as a threat to the district, the unlicensed vendors recognize the bid as a hazard to their livelihoods. Next slide. So Viva, I gotta go quickly through this. Viva La Comida, um, an outdoor event comprised of local businesses, art exhibitions, and live music, particularly highlights the clash between the bid, Q and U, and the vendors. The free summer event not only raises money for the bid and local businesses, but it also attracts people from all over the city, offering them a taste of the neighborhood. According to the bid's director, who organizes the event, quote, Viva La Comida is about boosting the local economy and at the same time promoting, a diverse, uh, promoting the, the diversity of the area. It is curated with the local community in mind. Working with local restaurants and food vendors, we create economic development while simultaneously creating a giant party, end quote. While Target had yet to occupy the space, of the, of the movie theater. As a sponsor of the event, the bid legitimized the chain's presence at the party. And the unlicensed vendor, however, were excluded from joining Viva La Comida. As a result, on the morning of the eighth annual Viva La Comida Festival in 2019, 15 activists from q &U took a stand against the bid and coalesced on 82nd Street. Their mobilization around the vendors was to show who they were in solidarity with, and a protest against the bid and its developments. As anticipated, the police soon appeared to remove the vendors before the start of the festival. Upon their arrival, the activists created a human shield around the vendors. Standing in solidarity with the vendors deterred the cops from displacing their operations. Although officially neglected to participate in the event celebrating the community, which they are an integral part of, the rally was seen as a victory as the vendors held their ground and made their typical daily earnings. By collectively occupying portions of the 82nd Street on the morning of Viva La Comida, the unlicensed vendors and q and comprising citizens and non-citizens alike, claimed the right to have rights. By asserting the vendors' rights to the sidewalk, they enacted uh, performative tensions in inherent and citizenship. Joel, yeah, next slide. 
So uh, I need to go very quickly through this because I'm out of time. Uh, this was not the only time that QNU backed up the, uh, the vendors along 82nd Street. Um, uh, over the years, they often used the vendors um, uh, as a way to, to counter the development. These were the focus um, uh, that uh, they often alluded to at, on social media, at um, local uh, council meetings. The vendors were often the primary focus that this development was going to um, displace. And as you can see at the top, the rendering of the, on the top right here, this was the plan initially um, initiated by the developers. And because of the, uh, the, the, the fight, the pushback from q and um, they uh, in, uh, eventually reduced um, and, and completely got rid of the 16-story uh, luxury component of uh, the development and um, changed it to um, just this two-story target development here. Um, so last slide, Joel. So the sidewalk practices that take place at the intersection offer, offer practical implications that are relevant as contemporary cities continue to generate dense concentrations of social variety. First, legal institutions must recognize that people perform citizenship, regardless of what their values, principles, or priorities may be. Moreover, legal institutions at all levels must also reassess the tensions between citizenship in law and citizenship in practice. This is because performance-based conceptions of citizenship, which focus on civic duties instead of nation-state authorization, not only accurately reflect contemporary society, but is also a vital obligation that governments, that governments must have to those living in their cities. Finally, instead of focusing on the responsibilities that citizens owe states, legal institutions must flip it and ask what the states owes those who perform the roles of citizens, particularly when it comes to feeding others, regardless of their status. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noah. Our next speaker is Dr. Sierra Versilo, who is uh, both a postdoctoral postdoctor, post fellow at UTSC and um, an adjunct professor at the University of Waterloo. And she's going to speak to us about globalizing local food system and food security in Tamale Ghana. Um, and so, since this is a, a new directions and food studies uh, panel, we're going to explore some new technical directions we're going to try and live Instagram her talk. It's very exciting. Um, and so although academics don't love social media, the partner organizations that we work with do. So in an effort to bring them to sort of part of this space. All right, so thanks for that introduction. I've been working with uh, the Feeding City Lab and the new Sustainable Food and Farming Research Cluster for the past year, and it has been tremendous because it's given me all new food for thought on how to take my research the new directions and the new partnerships. So in order to understand where this research is going, I, I should mention also where it's come from. Because my research has been placed in a particular place uh, for the past 10 years. So I've been working mostly with small scale farmers in Northern Ghana, uh, engaging with the literature in, around development studies, the African Green Revolution, to understand the way those systems are changing and changing people's diets. And through that research has led me to the closest city because farmers describe that their Agrarian changes are shaped by the city and people's diets are shaped by the rural. So this is what's inspired this research. So I'm going to talk sort of high level right now around more of the, the food studies aspect of the work. So I should mention, this is uh, one of my favorite fruit vendors uh, in Tamale. It's just across the street, close by to where I stay typically. Um, and she's been there ever since I arrived to the place 10 years ago. Uh, and it's one of the few spots you can get fresh fruit, even in the dry, the off season, you can always find bananas at least. Uh, it has fed me and kept me nourished and she's very well known. Um, and what's happening in this city in particular is it's called, it was called um, one of the fastest growing cities in Ghana, West Africa. Whether that's true or untrue, I don't know. I don't know how you would measure that. But what became immediately clear is just how much the food 
scene is evolving and developing. So in this research, I'm trying to understand how these local food systems are developing. So thinking about the literature on food systems has for me come from uh, the development studies world, which is very much focused on agricultural value chains or food chains, supply chains. Uh, and in this literature related to that is the sort of modern, modern way of thinking, modernist way, linear way of thinking about food system development, which is that it moves from a small scale uh, small processing to larger processing and then the rise of supermarkets and wholesalers. So in this particular context, so it's a secondary city around a, a million people. It's definitely in this sort of middle stages uh, and thinking because it's changing so quickly, it, it is a very important moment in time to capture and think through this, the way this is playing out. So that fruit vendor, the way the system is developing, it's many more of these kinds of retailers and restaurants uh, are coming up and popping up. So they look much more, uh, the infrastructure is changing, the culinary infrastructure is changing, which we've been talking about. Next slide, please. And so one of the key problems in the literature that's talked about in this food system transition or development is the nutrition transition, which is also thought to uh, people in this context, as well as across the global south, are moving from a state of hunger to a state of or, or undernutrition to a state of overnutrition. And so uh, this is seen as a very big problem. And this is one of our um, participants. She makes me breakfast in the mornings, an egg and bread, a fried egg and bread, uh, very different from what people in the rural communities eat. Next slide. Thank you. And in this theorization of how people's diets change related to food system developments and the problems arising for that, there are reasons for this. One is that um, imported foods become more available, more accessible, more global foods, industrial foods, and people choose to use them because they're cheaper, they're faster to prepare, uh, and they're associated with being upper class or part of the global elite. Uh, and so as people become enter into the middle class or want to enter into the middle class, uh, they choose to, to use these foods. And so uh, this, for example, Tasty Tom is a tomato paste company, and they'll go around trying to, to give restaurants, local vendors uh, marketing. So people will line their tables with the marketing or paint their storefronts with uh, all of this. And they're, they're a, a local company, but local global so recently repurchased by a, a foreign company and then on the right is um wagashe it's a local cheese but now served differently with a salad which is considered or constructed as something that's foreign not not um local or traditional so i'm thinking about these theories and what I'm finding uh, through the, the lens of food regimes or the corporate food regime commodification we've, we've been talking about um, to see how uh, it reshapes ge based on ge geography, class, and other intersecting uh, dimensions. And I'm particularly become <coughs> based on my findings or emerging findings, uh, how foods are seen as local, global, foreign, uh, traditional, and how people construct and are using this for their food sovereignty aims. And in the nutrition transition literature, there's this idea of, by some of the, the leading thinkers on this, of a fourth phase of transition, which is away from huge retailers to something that's more healthier, more sustainable, uh, and more traditional, which I thought was an interesting end to a modernizing food system. Um, like the post-capitalist, maybe industrial complex is something different. And so I thought that, that struck me and I'm hoping to interrogate that a little bit. Next slide. So looking at the food geographies of everyday life, looking at food security beyond just availability <coughs> or what's a focus in literature on accessibility to all the things we've been talking about uh, that food is. Um, so so looking at it beyond nutrition in the biomedical sense, to the political sense, the economic sense, to the <coughs> cultural sense. Uh, yes, next slide. 
So in this, I think this is an uh, important context to understand Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the fastest urbanizing places in the world. Uh, and as a result, that's having a, a major issue on the nutrition transition story. And Ghana in particular uh, is seen as a, a leader, one of the first democracies on the continent, a leader in um, food security initiatives. So it was one of the first countries on the continent to meet the Millennium Development Goal, but it also has some of the highest rates of obesity in, in West Africa. So, which really I was very surprised to hear because there's other countries like Nigeria. Uh, so this was really striking to me. And when you mention this to people uh, in Ghana, they are surprised and also not surprised because they're living through it. Uh, but yeah, it's, so obesity, for example, has increased two and a half times just within the past 10 years. And this is a context where uh, just within the past 20 years, I believe, uh, Ghana has moved from a lower income to a middle income country status. And um, uh, it has become officially uh, majority urban than rural. And it's seen as in the middle stages of development. Next slide. Oh, I just a uh, previous slide again, sorry. So I'm doing research in the northern region in Tamil, so it's quite far away from the capital of Accra, uh, considered a secondary city um, and quickly urbanizing as well. So this is a map of the city and the methodology that I take. I have a lot of data. So this is why I have to say this is a high level findings um, because I'm still working through a lot of it. I, so I conduct participatory uh, action research grounded in this particular place theoretically. And I'm basing it off of a work across these three communities, which differ based on uh, location. So the Zobeli community is very much in the city center, practically in the main market. Uh, the further away community, Jason Aili, uh, is where I can stay closer to. It's considered um, more of a true community and has a more diverse uh, class-based population. And then Taha, which is predominantly rural. So there's no electricity or low levels of electricity, no running water. So these are three comparable cases. And I chose those places based on a workshop that I held with different food system actors. So they're the ones who helped me form the questions, choose the location. So very much a, in a way a participatory process. So I've done interviews with different people, different market vendors, focus groups. Uh, and I'm interested in experimenting with different qualitative methods because I'm finding that the level of detail I'm getting isn't there. So I started doing oral histories, culinary demonstrations to get at what are the ingredients in the food that ingredients or how they're being prepared. And I'm going back in July to try photo voice to, to see if there's anything that's missing from the story that people can't recall when they're talking to me. Um, and then the use of visual aids has been a very useful tool in working with participants. So that's what I'm ex uh, kind of experimenting with. So findings, yes. So one of the th things that were persistently, one of the themes that persistently came up that's also based on nutrition transitions literature is that people are choosing to consume uh, much more highly processed food, uh, such as what's pictured here. When I think of Ghanaian food, uh, when this is not what comes to mind, but this is what people are eating uh, often or certain kinds of people are eating in certain kinds of places. Uh, and this was a problem that people talked about often, almost in every conversation that I've had. But what I think when I refer to highly processed food, I'm thinking of the instant spices. <coughs> so this meal was something I ate and I actually couldn't, couldn't actually eat it. The instant spices were so, like by the time the food entered my mouth, I was already getting heartburn. So it, <laughs> it was um, an interesting experience. And um, this is also something, these spices are also something people are cooking with at, at home as well, and it was a persistent theme and issue concern that people brought up for both health reasons, economic reasons, but also cultural and traditional knowledge uh, and, and ecological reasons, which I'll talk about slightly. So just to give you a sense of what people describe as foreign, um, KFC recently has come on the scene, 2017, um, they opened a, a store, uh, 100 CDs, 
for a family, although this would not feed a family, in my opinion, um, in Ghana, and 100 CDs is, is a substantial amount of money. Uh, so KFC is a, is a luxury food. It's a place where you would take a date or your, your wife for an anniversary in this context um, versus the, the cheap food that, that also a dish I could not eat in that Tasty Tom marketing sort of uh, infrastructure, which was an interesting, you can actually, that's my spoon, very difficult to eat this food uh, for me. So, and people say that they eat this all of the time, uh, this food anyway. Yes, thank you. So being trapped in this addictive cycles of taste. So this is where I, I think of what is considered delicious or what people want to eat is a very complex story and doesn't fit the nutrition transition that has been narrated in the literature. So one man in the focus group uh, explains the story that because food is available, these foods, these spices, these highly processed foods are available in the market, they're cheap and fast to use, they're tasty in a way because they're, they add flavor, salt, sugars, um, and people add them to everything, this addictive cycle continues. And he explains this persistent theme uh, very well, I think. So he says, we used to eat the cotton seed and dawa dawa with tea set. So cotton seed and dawa dawa were described as uh, ingredients that were foraged um, and used to, to make food delicious. Tea set is a staple dish. Uh, and he says, we were healthy, but now there is Maggie, Maggie being one of those instant spices. In the past, our great grandfathers were not eating Maggie. Now it has led to so many complications in terms of our health, causing waist pains and even stroke. Um, we have become used to it. And if it's not in soup, we will not feel like eating it. Even if you say you don't want Maggie, your wife will hide it and put it in soup. So we are stuck. So that's where this idea of being addicted, it's, it's, a, it's a choice, it's not a choice, it's complex. Uh, next slide. Um, so yes, the story, these are a list of uh, a picture of what's being sold of instant spices. It's cheaper, it's faster to use, but I think what's also not talked about is it's related to the African Green Revolution. So how agrarian plants use is changing, I won't get into that for, for time purposes, um, but and also for <coughs> but this is something that my research is is hopefully going to, to tease apart further. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to dig more into these, what's, what was called by many key informants and food sovereignty actors as disappearing and underutilized ingredients. So they didn't call them traditional ingredients, they call or their heritage ingredients, they called them disappearing and underutilized ingredients. And this was a particular choice in the efforts to, towards sovereignty and localization. Uh, this is a, a, a one, an example of a type of dish, and that is a, a particular spice. Yes. Uh, and I wanted to feature the Ghana Food Movement, who is one of our local uh, partner organizations that we are, we recently won a grant uh, to work with along with other food sovereignty organizations uh, to support them through knowledge mobilization, but also to learn from them, to contribute to the story on what food sovereignty looks like in this particular place, which is different than maybe other places focused almost entirely on the agrarian systems, peasant farmers. These, these groups are also focusing on taste, sort of, uh, they've just explained, we'd love the slow food mandate to, to take that on. And I thought that was a very uh, different story than what I had been reading about. So this is Chef Abiro. He'll be joining me in a kitchen session on the AS, at the ASFS next week. We're going to prepare Dawa Dawa Jollof, which is a particular style of Jollof rice uh, from, from Northern Ghana. Uh, and they do all sorts of really interesting things. And as you can see, they're a very diverse group as well. They are a group of people who could choose to do anything, to live anywhere. They are not peasants or small scale farmers. <laughs> they are educated, urban elite. And this is the work that they're choosing to do. And I found that really interesting. Next slide. So this is just quickly a video um, that I wanted to highlight to describe the video. Yeah. 
always kind of had this hybrid fordist mix. People don't fit neatly into this kind of like small vendors, big supermarkets, then going into purely like luxury small goods or unaffordable small goods. And then the mix of customers as well is kind of quite various across all of these different spaces and economic strategies. So I was curious then, how do people in the field or in these where they are, or like how this system exists, where it's going, and then how would you kind of like translate that? How would you characterize what is this, what what kind of like name of the system are we in, um, and how does this relate to the past and how where is this going according to your mind? Sorry. Great. Thank you so much. I think many of you can. Yeah. <laughs> Should we maybe have a couple questions before we respond to that? Oh, I, I, I think we have time for one at a time. I, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of like, a, how do we solve all the issues of the world question? So, uh, <laughs> how, do you, how do people theorize or characterize this? The contemporary food system. Or like, what is this this stage? What is this called for them and for you? I, I'm not an optimist, so I'm, you know. Uh, uh, but I have a daughter, and I want to be. You know, like so. Uh, it's a. Uh, believe me, I have my my days in which I I wish my findings were like yes, hundred percent like sustainable. You know, fish, uh, the market works, you know, and uh, uh, I mean, we often find it does. Um, uh, not to say that, you know, state uh, sponsored initiatives work better, uh, you know, in a strongly liberal. Um, so, people speaking about like what moment this is, like, uh, uh, you know, in sort of a political economy and political science, just like spiel about like a post-neoliberal mm -hmm. moment. And, and yet I find that um, that the ways in which we're in this post-neoliberal moment is that state themselves are embracing, you know, neoliberal practices that basically we're in the post-neoliberal moment because like you know, has become so common wisdom that is uh, that is uh, just the, the way in which uh, many organizations operate. Now, um, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, like, I, I, I think that, uh, um, yeah, I don't know, I don't want to, like, crowd the, the plate, but I don't know if other just want to, it's a hard question to tackle, like, yeah, I have a very simple response. Um, I think as long as we live in societies where profit making continues to be um, prioritized over life making, people at the bottom of the social art hierarchy are going to continue to have these challenges. And so that systemic thing needs to be captured. We've been in that for a long time, so it doesn't mean you knew. Um, but that's something that um, I kind of want to continue to admire and work on the, the, the power structures, the institutions. Which I can control as cities, understanding how they're reproducing inequality in regards to food access and food sovereignty. And just to, to add to that, in terms of like where food studies is, I would say, what does food studies do? I mean, that's what can we do? Uh, and I think it's important to take a position, uh, which is why I'm sort of endeavoring in the field of community of scholar activism. I think we should take a position. I think it should, we should not remain objective neutral. It's, it's in some of the literature, there's an attempt at this. You know, there is a focus on healthy food um, or delicious food or traditional food, but I think it taking a position um, in terms of supporting under research with the types of initiatives that should be pursued as opposed to sort of the neoliberal industrial complex needs to happen. And um, Maybe one thing I would suggest is to work with the food studies scholars could work with a more diverse, or continue to work with a diverse set of actors, uh, 
not just policymakers or not just uh, peasant farmers or not just market vendors or chefs, like everyone across the world. So that does mean something I, would, I have found very beneficial and I think maybe that's the future. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, and maybe I just say quickly, I mean, you know, not to sound alarmist, but I mean, I think it, it is the case that we'll go on with a different food system or not at all. Um, and part of the reason why I've been so invested and interested in studying like post-secondary institutions recently is because, <clears throat> I mean, the, you know, the, the kind of like social reproduction that happens on campus, it's like, and, and the historical precedent for universities literally shifting shifting history both both good and bad I mean, we can also think about i mean i didn't mention this in my presentation but we can also think about for example you know the chicago school mm -hmm. right <laughs> and and how that is like fundamentally transformed <clears throat> our world um uh but it could be otherwise right it could be otherwise it's, uh you know the work that marnie's doing and you know lots of other people in this room for example uh are you know trying to figure out how do we create a food system that can sustain the world, like literally not in the world. Right now, our food system is literally destroying the world. Right? I mean, it's, you know, we all know that. And what kind of food system, you know, could do otherwise? And, and so, and I think, yeah, again, universities have to be centrally important to that. I think, uh, while also dealing with, as I said, these uh, imminent and existential threats of you know, liberalism, fascism, etc., that are sort of increasingly penetrating these these walls. We have a question for us here in the chat. Hey guys. Azindo. Azindo, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Sarah. Hi. This is Azindo from Ghana. Great to see you again. Thank you for joining. Uh, you're welcome, Sarah. Sarah, a quick question. So what actually accounts for the resurfacing of some of the food that you describe or classify as dying uh, foods, uh, traditional foods in our markets. For instance, so a few years back, I think it was impossible to find something like processed uh, uh, baobab powder, processed dawa dawa, and other things in the market. The last time I visited Tamale market, somewhere December, I could find all these things in the market. But these are things that we are classifying as things that are going extinct or people are no longer interested in them. And then when you go for uh, occasions these days, you find out that this so-called or this traditional food are served alongside the Western ones. What accounts for these things in our system now? The so-called dying food, Vista Pacin. Now even you can find them in the markets. Thank you. Azindo, thank you. Uh, or I should say, Dr. Drisu, can you um, introduce yourself to us, please? Okay. My name is Azindo, uh, a, a, a lecturer, and uh, I work in Gagarian Studies. I'm with the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana. Thank you so much. So um, thank you for that uh, somewhat validating response. Because... <laughs> So as Indo, um, I met actually as at a presentation I gave, um, I was invited to, to present my work to a group I had never met uh, before uh, from my dissertation, which was uh, an amazing experience, by far the most validating thing I've ever done. Um, it beats even publishing an article because ultimately this research is for them. And the fact that they invited me to share that was nice. and. Uh, Hopefully, as you know, you can join us at the workshop in July, present your own work. He's published in Peasant Studies and other things on agrarian systems. But I, I, say that, I say it's a validating response because, a validating question, because I am, I do have this sense that the system is changing in Tamale so, so quickly. It's as we're talking about it, that the place is shifting and moving and evolving. So, and, and people are talking about it as such, and they don't know how to make sense of it. They don't know what to eat. They're scared to eat. They're anxious to eat. They don't know where to get their food. Um, and then you've got the crisis on top of that. You've got inflation, you've got an agrochemical crisis, a soil crisis, a political crisis, and it's a hunger crisis, for lack of a better term. 
So what accounts for this? I, I think um, it's a response to anxiety. Is in the, it's out of desperation. I, I, I hope it stays in the sense that what a crisis brings uh, is also an opportunity. It forces people to no longer stay with the status quo. We cannot eat these foods anymore. They are destroying us, destroying our world. We have to do things differently. So when I speak to market vendors, they'll explain, my customers are demanding processed baobab, demanding processed dawa dawa, because typically it would take them three days or longer to forage and ferment. I don't want, they don't want to buy Maggie. They want to eat those things because they recognize there are health consequences. So even in that focus group that I did in Taha that I quoted, in which is the more uh, rural-like neighborhood, in a one-hour conversation, we went from, oh, we want to eat at KFC to this food doesn't, is killing us. It doesn't taste particularly good. <laughs> Why do we want to eat it? You white people brought this. We need, to, we need sovereignty, we need decolonization. Within one hour conversation, and there's a need for information. So Azindo, I think I don't have a, an easy answer to this question because it is changing, but I think out of desperation um, and also the breakdown of our global food system and the government not knowing how to respond or not responding well, uh, there's a resurgence of, of these other foods. And then that you have the Ghana food movement, you know, the Peasant Farmers Association, they are pushing global food markets in response to this crisis. That's my um, hunch, I guess, and hope to write with you and others, you know, this, this July more about it. Thank you. We have another question from the chat. Uh, I have a question. Oh, <laughs> can I ask that? Of course. No, 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 no. <laughs> totally talking with you. I use my privilege. One thing that I noticed in all of your papers is some kind of question about the state. There's an absence of the state, or seemingly doing the work of the state in Peru, or or possibly um, you know seeing the violence of the state on the campus, uh, and then you know possibly also the violence of the state in, in the city. I'm wondering if there is a sense of a positive role for the state in your various uh, enterprises or focuses that you're working on. Sure. Uh, and what that might look like. Maybe I can make this question. Sure, yes. I wanted to ask something similar to particularly to Alice Bowman and to uh, uh, well, I, I appreciate your distinction between in, um, in law uh, citizenship and in practice. Because I think that in law citizenship is based on social divide and social hierarchy for several reasons. But how uh, do you think the process should happen? So, how to institutionalize actually? Otherwise, the risk of abuse, of crimes, of mm -hmm. uh, organized organizations which organize uh, an alternative system of distribution in the state that are among the two, I think is the key. So I, 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 I took the point because I think there is this, this, this problem with who know citizenship if we consider people discriminate by race, uh, social conditions and um, cultural tools and so on. But in the same time, I think that uh, uh, it, it is necessary to, to think how to institutionalize this, yeah. not, not, not going to the, towards the legal system, because you don't have the same problem here. And, and so, similar to Sarah, is which is the attitude of the state towards the fiscal world? Because I, I, I think this, this grassroots movements are really very important, but at the same time, the forces they are confronting with are so powerful that you probably need something much powerful. Thank you. So, hello. Um, in regards to Joel's question, positive, um, one way you could look at uh, New York City's role of um, perhaps um, not necessarily imposing enforcement 
on these particular vendors. They do in other parts of the city for some, for some, for various reasons in this part of Queens, where there are many different um, groups living together. It's kind of a state of exception um, where they are able to. Um, they do the vendors um, run into problems by the health department, police department, but. As Donna's case illustrated, she's been there for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so without having uh, documentation to 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 uh, formally work in the United States, she was able to do that. So perhaps they're looking the other way as a form of positive item. Mean, that's one way of looking at it. Um, and uh, Paolo, thank you for your question. And unfortunately, I'm going to have an unsatisfying response to it. Although I um, have been trained to do more practitional or, or practical based um, research, my work is now um, falling into more basic research. And um, I think the discussions with the decision makers who can um, perhaps make some pragmatic um, changes to um, conceptualizations of citizenship at the urban and or national level needs to be have. I haven't had those in this paper, um, uh, which is currently an R and R. Um, I perhaps could um, engage with you know the stakeholders that do have a better understanding of this to create some uh, uh, you know empirical implications rather than the more uh, conceptual ones that I that I uh, bring forward. So I appreciate and afford something I need to um, interrogate for. Just engage with what the reviewer is saying. <laughs> I think Sarah, I mean, the question was also. Yeah, for you. just a maybe just a quick response because I actually get this question around the state in state in almost every presentation I get, um, and it's extremely important because I think political economy analyses, for example, don't really do the state justice. And in this, in the context of Ghana, like you know, I think many, at least African states. Uh, you can't talk about the state in isolation, you have to talk about the role of international donors. So, for example, um, like something like, <laughs> don't quote me on this, uh, but you know, over half of the government's budget for food comes from donors, and half of that budget come, goes directly to, to cocoa, you know, export oriented production. So, and, and when you, so I, I've worked with this. State. I've worked in Ghana with the ministry's extension officers. They're persistently underfunded. They're trying to work with thousands of one extension agent, thousands and thousands of small scale farmers, no infrastructure of any sort, no very basic um, support. And so, in order to do anything in Ghana, you have to work with the state and therefore the values of international donors as well. So, I think. Yeah, it, there is this hierarchy. And that's why my work was focused uh, in development studies because of how much of an influence international donors have in this space. And the last thing I was to say on this is civil society ha has these groups like the Ghana Food Movement. I've heard literally someone say, we do not want to work with the state whatsoever. We don't want to rely on the state. We don't want to rely on donors. We're going to rely on each other, and we were in the diaspora and get funding from from that space. Even though there's as many citizenship questions and identity <coughs> and class questions, that's the direction they're choosing to move in, and they're trying to come up with these innovative business models to self-sustain their initiatives. Whether that's working or not is, uh, is, is in experimentation. And that's what I want to write about because it's very different than maybe what, what other, uh, that looked like in other places at other moments in time. So it's a very important question. If, if I may add just very quickly, I don't want to like fall into an old adage of uh, like the, the absence of the state, like by no means. The state is very much present. The state is promoting, spending millions of dollars promoting these type of restaurants that tell themselves as, a, as, as promoting like sustainable seafood, right? Like, so it's just present. Um, how it chooses to be present and what uh, is, I think, you know, to be seen and remain 
interesting questions. Uh, but the state is there and is you know investing resources in this. How these resources are invested in promotion and in uh, and marketing rather than in actual you know the development of, of infrastructure that can allow us to have more sustainable seafood are, are the questions that we should be asking. But it's kind of like a very classic neoliberal statement. It's a proven one that chooses to well just like give you know money to the chefs to do their thing and promote their thing internationally so uh so that we can you know get like the us and canada to buy more mac and other other uh other uh types of fishes that are now being uh over over extracted mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Michael, did you want to jump oh, in on okay. my question yeah. Yeah. Okay. um so before we so i know you have a question um uh, before we go to that question, I just wanted to acknowledge that there's a comment in the chat um, from Caffeine Dubé um, that, um, and I don't know, Caffeine, did you want to uh, come in on this and, and, or I can also just read your comment. Okay, great. Um, so health, economic, and other reasons, it's interesting to attempt to further understand uh, by experiencing the conditions and confines in various ways. It may not be a choice for some people around the world. It's also interesting how power structures like institutions share knowledge with various donors. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. I have a question for Sierra actually. So, I mean, part of your presentation reminded me of um, at some point of the of the boom of quinoa in the US, in the New York Times, and in the Guardian, in the UK, appeared the, the, you know, this rumor that uh, quinoa has turned into like such an appreciated comedy to, in the international market that quinoa growers were stopping to eat quinoa and now they eat like pasta and tomato sauce, right? And uh, and it created such a buzz like in the global north, like the news in the New York Times and the Guardian was shared everywhere. I'm sure you all saw it. Um, and uh, and we, we found evidence later that it was actually bogus, that it was actually like a person that, you know, said that person, that person, that person. And then actually there's like a few um, survey based and, you know, and, and ethnography based research that suggested that actually, you know, people, quinoa growers are adding things like pasta to their diet, but they still pretty much consume a lot of quinoa. And that the problems with uh, quinoa production were not so much whether they were replacing their diet with another things, but just because the, the demand of the market was uh, for specific varieties of quinoa. So the standardization that supermarkets and Trader Joe's requires were the ones that were causing the real problems farmers because they were like basically mono, uh, producing monoculture. So I was wondering if you, you're seeing something similar in, in Ghana because, uh, you know, um, kind of like there's some interesting similarity there to be to be addressed. I, I think so. In some senses, uh, of course, quinoa is like its own uh, extreme case. That's a very interesting one. What I what I'm observing uh, it, in my work related to, to interrogating the African Green Revolution is this push towards those those monocropping of uh, industrial staples, uh, not just for export but for to feed the country. So things like a very particular kind of maize uh, is, is now commonly eaten in dishes that were once made from sorghum or millet. Uh, and then there's these waves of support for food based on international donor development fads. And they're linked to the rhetoric around nutrition. Because this is perception that hunger is, is a problem, of course, it is a problem, but how to solve that problem is a very um, simplistic notion that nutrition is an issue of vitamins and minerals, and they're using agriculture to do that work. So getting people, and then so every couple of years, a new food will be peddled and pushed to farmers, and also taught in that a teaching of how to consume those crops at home. So something like uh, when I first arrived, it was butternut squash being peddled on farmers. And I literally being peddled because the extension agents I was working with were asking me, how can you go out and teach people how to eat this food? Because we've never seen it before. And Ghanaians don't like anything that's sweet. So how do I make this into a soup? And I am 20 years old and I have no idea how to cook. Like, you know, and, and, and then it was sweet potato. Now it's soy. 
Um, soy. soy is a very interesting, um, happy to talk about that in a, in a bit more detail. And um, it's related to the Gates Foundation, poultry, American Soybean Association. There's a lot of political economic questions there. Um, and in Ghana, very important nutrition, agri-nutrition questions. Uh, so I think, yeah, um, these, these, it, it is related to production. We have, we end also to the state and wider political economy in, in development studies as well. So, not sure if I answered that, no, no, but perfect. a very interesting question. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I don't know who was first, uh, but maybe we can collect those two questions and then um, have those questions. <coughs> Yeah, we know we know about that. I touched on it already a little bit, but but I will ask it anyways. Um, I I was really inspired by the way your um, partnership, your research partnership, came about, and I thought that was um, fascinating. My question is: Do you plan to go back to the restaurants to talk to them about the results? What do you anticipate um, some of their responses might be? Um, and is there an opportunity to work with them? This is anticipating, I guess, the next question, the sec session that we have from Food Studies to Food Action. So, is there an opportunity to collaborate with them on knowledge mobilization and traceability, for example? Do you see that as a, as a possible outcome? Um, oh, sorry, I was oh, going to connect them and then. Yeah, yeah. Well, mine is very different. I will talk a lot. I mean, it's going to be hard to version of the previous two months. Um, it's, it's more on, on like all the call to action though, and it's like very inspiring, like all the work that they're doing. Um, I work with Professor Class in San Diego and still work on the research project. Um, for the other three projects I, I didn't know about, and it's very inspiring. And I wonder because like they're like also like based abroad, um, how can we like do something here in Toronto? Like I think for Professor Class's project is very straightforward, and we would love for all of you to collaborate with for the garden. Um, but how do we start like kind of maybe shifting our narratives and perceptions of certain cultures or certain people or maybe how we can like start making some decisions here as well so, so that's my question. I think they're tied together beautifully thank you for that can we start um yeah um it'll be brief so yeah I mean we we have uh Daniel and I have discussed at length whether we should like tell the restaurants, um, I mean, we all, we want to tell that, uh, of course, Peru is not far, I mean, it's far from here, so it's not easy to find the time to go and then like, you know, have time. We, we definitely will with some of them. I'm in close contact with a lot of them, so some with some of them I've been like, dude, you know, uh, uh, you know. So put it in academic space. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in, in academic spiel. And, uh, um and and you know some of them already know or some of them already suspect that that's that's the case and and they think that even if that that even if you find uh you know some evidence that they don't they they will some of them will respond like well that was one instance and when i say well that was actually five instances yeah. because like in some persons we actually uh took uh even though it was like Two years we took in each time like multiple samples. Uh, it was actually seven or five. Um, a lot of them will say, "Well, you know, that time maybe you know." Um, more more critical ones will just like acknowledge the the fact that for for um, how restaurants are run, which is you know like it's like a very fast paced, you know, often you know violent. Uh, organization with you know a lot of stuff including like gender violence which I already did research about going on uh, it, it's hard to also like you know um, deal with these issues beyond trusting purveyors right um, so um, I think that um, there are a few that are investing as much as they can in uh, making small communities of, uh, of fishermen you know just like less precarious so that then the fishermen themselves can uh be more responsible and uh you know not feel the necessity of engaging into uh practices that you know go beyond the informal 
you know, relationship that they that they have. So for me, Great, thank you. Michael, Sarah, Noah. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll just jump in real, real quick on this question. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, I think, I mean, it, you know, it's a great question just in terms of, of this kind of action piece. And I, um, you know, I was inspired by the, the feminist economist, uh, J.K. Gibson Graham, who write about the, the, the ubiquitous starting place of here now in terms of thinking about, about change. And, and the way that, I mean, I've sort of been, I mean, you know, I, I wrote a book about the Holland March, which is like an hour from here. And then I started doing, you know, focusing on urban, which is now doing campus food systems. So I just keep my, my diagram, you know, I'll be studying my own kitchen uh, in the year. So at this rate, but, Can I study it too? Yeah, 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 that's right. We can find out if Michael's using fake fish. <laughs> right, right, right. I hope I already not. tested your, your oysters lately. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so I, so, but I think you could do that, but <clears throat> always through uh, a kind of a, a political economic lens, right? That situates whatever you're looking at within the broader sort of, you know, political, economic, ecological kind of forces that are, are sort of shaping that, that context. So, uh, you know, that's not a sort of specific prescription, I guess, but I just think that that notion of that we all have a ubiquitous starting place if you are now is, you know, something that I use as a bit of a lodestar, you know, to, to sort of guide the kind of work. Um, I'll just say on this, this idea on a call to action. I think based on this idea, um, this the struggles locally are global struggles, right? So uh, we were at Choco Soul yesterday, which is much bigger of an idea and a practice than chocolate, fine chocolate, right? And I immediately got on WhatsApp and called directors of the Ghana Food Movement and was like, we, you need to learn from each other because this is very special. So I think, I think it's in the Feeding City Lab, we talk a lot about the local global because at the end of the day, we're seeing these persistent patterns and so, uh, work towards sovereignty is, is really fundamentally about the same principles. And uh, civil society movements are about like little actions everywhere for, for transformative change. So that that's how we in you know in Toronto or in, in other places can come together to support each other. Uh, and then this um, really to Jackie's question and, and you know your response like I've been sharing working to share my dissertation findings in a very I've done very like politically correct, polite <laughs> policy influence, you know, I'm, I'm going to Malawi to present some of the political economy work on agronutrition around soy and these to, to the people who are funding this, the research on sweet potato varieties that are nutrient dense and are doing this work, the international donors that are doing this work. And it's all well and done. I just, um, I think it's important to now like be explicit, call out the contradictions, call out the paradoxes, there's no, we're in a crisis, like, we, there's no room, in my opinion, personally, room for politeness anymore, if, if we're in a crisis, we're in an emergency, um, so I'm, I'm now working with this, those sovereignty organizations, these organizations who I do think are going to make a change, and whenever I call out their contradictions, because of their principles and values, they're like, you're right, we need to do it differently, let's figure out how, they're always willing to accept their own mistakes. I, I, like that's a sign that that's someone you need to work with and support. I don't know if that answers your question, but I was thinking about your research and, and the kinds of questions I've asked to our partners and our participants and their own personal response. And you as a scholar as well, right? So we have like almost an ethical responsibility. Thank you so much. One last words. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, I think with regards to this particular research and case study that I put forward today, I, I hope, um, yeah, in addition to exploring natural, tangible, practical ways, potentially um, making a direct connection between the performative practices of citizenship uh, in relation to the in law, this, that this research really just kind of open up people's eyes, regardless of where you are in the world understand the importance of these kinds of practices, food practices that may seem informal or illicit, they are vital to people's livelihoods and sense of belonging. So I hope anything it, it, it achieves that. Mm -hmm.
Great. So, Nathan, at best, this is such inspiring, important work that you all do. And please all join me in thanking our film. Some coffee outside and wash your thanks so much for joining us all this is of course part of with with deep thanks to to joe and to davide uh domenici um this is really the beginning of something and, and a continuation of a of what's by now a fairly long-standing relationship between uh Aria and the university of, of bologna and uh this is really trying to take that collaboration to the next stage. And I know people have already had ideas and thoughts and wishes for what they would like this collaboration to be. And we will be working on those. If you can, if you have those ideas, however in Koi, if you can grab us over lunch, Davide over here, Joe here, and Paolo uh, here, uh, just grab us over lunch and share some of those ideas. That would be deeply, deeply appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And so now it's my turn to, to chair this last session of this wonderful meeting. And let me just say that I'm so grateful huh, for this because it allows me to, to thank to thank you all for participating in this meeting, which, as Dan said, is the kind of a first step or, or, or the beginning of, of something uh, in the future collaboration between Toronto, uh, Bologna, and maybe Amsterdam. And so uh, yes, we are really willing to, to understand what can be done in the future, what we uh, uh, can do thanks to this uh, agreement. So thank, thank you, thank you all uh, again. So when, without further ado, now uh, I have to introduce you. Well, there is a, a small switch in the program, as you may have noticed. Uh, we are um, starting with uh, uh, Jackie Rohel, uh, who is postdoctoral fellow at the Jackman Humanities Institute. And the title of her presentation is Bringing Voices from the Food Front Lines to the Lab and the Wall. Please, Jackie. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I will keep my presentation relatively brief because Joe, uh, I will briefly introduce the lab and one of the projects that we're doing. Um, and then Joe, uh, we'll hand it over to Joe and she'll uh, dive a little bit further into some of the global projects. And I would like to leave a lot of time for a discussion. Um, so my focus today is to introduce you to um, a SHRC funded connections project. We uh, were awarded a SHRC connections grant in 2022. Over the last year, we've been um, starting to put the pieces in motion um, to build up this project, which is a podcast series and a public scholarship project called um, Voices from the Food Front Lines, Pandemic and Beyond. And we will shortly be ready to start publishing some of the episodes. So this is really a perfect moment to introduce you to some of the work we've been doing. Um, and a couple of the RAs um, who've been working on the project are, are joining us um, today, including Jesse. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please, Joel. So I joined the Feeding City uh, project when it was still a project before it was a lab in 2020. Um, this year, I am the new media public humanities postdoctoral fellow at the Jackman Humanities Institute at uh, St. George campus just up the street here. Um, and I was based at the JHI last year as a community engaged humanities early career fellow. And I'll be returning next year to the lab um, at UTSC to continue work on this project and other projects as well. Um, but my work is very much coming, it, it's, it's coming from the background of food studies, um, but action oriented and community engaged. And um, with the lab at the Feeding City Lab, um, we do a lot of research co-creation um, in what I call applied humanities, I mean, interest playing humanities and social sciences. Um, so this particular project is an opportunity to um, build connections um, with um, partners 
and amplify voices. So if we think about the purpose of what a podcast series is or can be, thinking about your own listening experiences um, over the past several years, who, who listens to podcasts? Yeah, okay. I'll ask you about your favorite ones and why after. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I'm not there yet, but yes, okay. <laughs> Um, we can think about podcasts as particular kinds of sound stories um, that bring together entertainment and also education. Um, we can also think about podcasts as a tool for public scholarship and research dissemination. So this is where I will give a little plug out to Gastronomica on the Heritage Radio Network. Um, with my colleagues on the collective, I produce the Gastronomica podcast series where you can tune in um, to listen to conversations with authors who have been recently published in the journal. So that's an, that's an example of um, amplifying <coughs> research. We can also think about podcasts as teaching tools um, and ped pedagogical tools, bringing them into the classroom. Um, and, and to these uh, reasons or rationales for, for developing podcasts, we can also add a couple of more. And this is really what's driving our initiative here at the Feeding City Lab. Um, in generating this, this podcast series. So one of them is to create an archive of experiences and to document the voices of people who have been working in the food system um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond to learn about um, their experiences and also their hopes and aspirations for the future. Um, the second is uh, taking that one step further to um, use the podcast series uh, and podcast episodes, interviews with, with people who work on the food front lines as an advocacy tool to help bring about change. Um, so to, to think about it as informing public policy and the opportunity to inform public policy. And then another dimension, another layer um, is forging connections and building a network. And this can be with our community partners, it can be with other universities and other researchers, it can be with um, you know, policy makers as well. So podcasts um, are, are fundamentally collaborative projects in their production, and I would also argue in their kind of dissemination. Um, so this is really the, the driving force behind this particular project. Go to the next slide, please. So um, for the Shirt Connections grant, there are three primary components. One of them is the podcast series itself. And I'll give you a little sneak peek into that shortly. Um, this includes, uh, we have ten, eight to 10 episodes in production right now, which will be, um, we'll start to make available this month and over the coming weeks um, with more episodes to follow in the fall. And Sierra and Noah will be taking our mobile podcast kit to the field this summer as well. So um, you can stay tuned to hear some of the um, conversations and interviews that they're doing in the field um, later in the fall. Um, so we have a set of upcoming episodes with um, coordinators of urban agriculture, uh, market gardens, farmers market managers, soup kitchen and food bank organizers, restaurateurs of small uh, food enterprises in Toronto and beyond. Um, so there is an opportunity to um, build relationships and um, this is very much, I would say, the outcome of, of some of the work we've been doing in the Feeding City Lab over the last three years and building trust with our community partners so that we can then um, have a conversation, amplify their voices, bring their insights, their lessons learned um, to a public audience um, for food system change. Um, so one dimension of, this, of the series is the episodes themselves. The second is we will be connecting these episodes, um, which will be publicly available, to research insights. So um, essentially implications for pedagogy, for public policy, and for building research connections globally. Um, and then the third um, comes out of this uh, research insights um, step, um, which is a toolkit and uh, a how-to guide. Um, which we'll, we'll be making available to our partners, I think also on our website, so that others can also kind of um, develop their own podcast episodes um, and, and, and we can share the learnings, not just the outcomes um, with, our, with our academic partners. Um, and we will be translating these how-to guides with, um, into other languages as well. Okay, go to that. Hello. <laughs> You can go to the next um, um, So this is an example of our, 
our online platform, the Defeating City Lab. Um, and we have a page on the platform dedicated specifically to the Food Frontline Voices um, series. And I just wanted to credit our in-house podcast production team. Um, Joel, Joel, if you can just share the website. Share this one, but no, the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah perfect. Um, with the team that we've been working with over the course of the past year to develop these podcasts, and I just wanted to emphasize that all of this is done in house in the lab, from pre planning to the recording to the post production to the writing of the show notes. Um, so this is this is research communication from the ground up. <laughs> um, and um, just wanted to credit and thank our, our wonderful RAs as well. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, I can share with you the trailer, which is now available online. Do we go back to the online? Actually, you can just um, I play it from there. From there yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, it's on the yeah. That's the that's the copy of the site. Okay. <laughs> It's not a problem of so much of food production and of distribution. And so whether it's through the rescuing food to make tasty, culturally irrelevant meals that SEMA and her organization do, or through the community garden and the other food sovereignty initiatives that they are saying, like the the number one issue was like cost, like our food costs more than the I don't know whether the city officials realize small charities like us, not the profits. Need some kind of policy, some kind of support, steady support to be able to do what you're doing because we're not a business, right? We're not selling product to make money. We're trying to rescue food and, and repurpose it and, and again distribute it to people who are in Physically growing and pulling your own carrot is not the only way to get involved in food or to access food. So it's great that we have this opportunity. It's enable local supply chains. But also, it's really important to recognize that markets are at its core about diversity. And we talk about diversity of seeds, uh, diversity of crops, diversity of people, and diversity of cultures. And that's why there's a lot of alignment when we think about rebuilding our mid sized uh, food distribution infrastructure. Um, that we recognize that for us to transition to a sustainable food system, we need to think about all the aspects of our food. Voices from the Food Front Lines brings listeners first-hand accounts from the people who have nourished their communities during global crisis and envisions pathways toward sustainable, local food futures in Canada and beyond. Voices from the Food Front Lines is coming April 2023 and will be available on your favorite podcast platform. For more information about the Feeding City Lab, visit www.utsc.utoronto.ca slash project slash Feeding City. So that was the trailer. Um, they will be available on our website, on our platform. Um, but for everybody who has a phone here today, uh, you can subscribe like right now. Um, <laughs> and we'll also share the, the, the link with you um, afterwards. So right now it's available on the Podbean app. This is the platform that we're using to develop the, to uh, build the RSS feed and, and um, drop the episodes. And we will be also connecting it to our YouTube channel and eventually, um, and not too long from now, Apple Podcasts. But for now, if you'd like to access and subscribe um, the Podbean podcast app, you don't need to create a, um, a profile. You can just um, subscribe once you search for voices from the food front lines. And then that means that you'll be notified every time um, we drop a new episode. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a quick sneak peek into some of the back end of the podcast production. Um, if we can go to slide six, Joel. This is uh, our mobile recording kit. We did a workshop last week for members of our team um, on how to, how to use the kit, um, how to get good quality audio when you're in the field, when you're, um, when you're traveling. We have, um, this has been really successful and we, our team has actually purchased um, two additional field kits um, so that our members of our lab can, can uh, create podcast interviews when they're traveling this summer. Um, and then the idea is that the interviews would come back to our team and we'd go through post-production um, in the lab. Um, we use Audacity for all the post-production. And then the, the next slide, please. 
Um, we have an episode report. So this is again, um, a lot of the process of creating a podcast is not in that moment of recording. It's all of the work planning it. And then in, in hopefully there's not too much editing at, at the, on the other end, but cleaning up the audio, um, adding the intro and the outro and the music as well as um, sound effects to help amplify that story. So this is um, an episode uh, report template that we've generated to help keep all that information in one place, which is really important um, when you're working as a team because all of these episodes are developed. There's multiple hands working on, on each episode. Um, so it helps us stay connected. Um, and then we've also, our, our team of RAs also created a sound archive. So we've generated our own sounds that we can add to uh, the podcast. And we're always looking for new sound ideas and wild sounds that we could drop in. So if you have ideas, um, let us know. Next slide. Um, and then finally, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the burgeoning field of scholarship in sound and public humanities and using podcasts um, and, uh, as a form of storytelling and public scholarship. And so these are some key sources that have been really helpful to us in the lab um, for building up the grant um, and eventually um, implementing it this past year. So I'm going to pass it over to Jo now, and she's going to um, share a little bit more about some of the research partnerships, um, where we see this going um, in the long term. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Oh, you can clean up both websites as well, the city and also the SFP one. Sure. Okay, so uh, now it is the turn of um, Jo Sharma. Well, actually, she doesn't need any introduction, but an associate professor of history at the University of Toronto. And let me say the real driving force behind the agreement between Bologna and uh, Culinaria. So let me again thanks Joe for all the, the, the work she did. And now Joe will be um, speaking about from food security to food sovereignty, the feeding city um, SF3 lab. Well, like everyone else, I've, <laughs> I've ch changed the title. <laughs> so, okay. so I wanted to actually say that I'll be talking about the Feeding City Lab, but also how it intersects with a cluster. And Nino's led the way in talking about the exciting mm -hmm. partnership he's developed with the natural sciences. And I want to actually say the Feeding City Lab is very, very invigorated and excited because we are now partnering with a couple of other labs. Some of you met our collaborator from TMU yesterday, uh, Sarah Elton, whose Eco Health Food Systems Lab is one of our collaborators. Uh, Professor Mayan Rani Isaac is there, the Canada Research Chair in Urban Agriculture, who's an agroecology scholar amongst the many different things she does. But it is both the Isaac Lab a number of other uh, science labs at UTSC, but also the new cluster we've been developing. And I'm delighted to say that we have two new postdocs coming in, one new, but they are going to be both bringing their skills and expertise. One is Dr. Joel Dico, <laughs> who has finally stopped being a graduate student. Well, <laughs> <laughs> And Dr. Jacqueline Rohel, who has come full circle because long before we had a lab, before we had culinary even, back in 2013, 2012, 2013, she as a graduate student from NYU, a Canadian living in the US, had a good sense to move back <laughs> recently, actually started collaborating with us on a small project to work with community cooks and the community gardeners at Melbourne Scarborough. And of course, you heard one of the voices of Claire Pertula, the wonderful manager of the Melbourne Urban Farm. And I will say, I see Joe Nasser there from Toronto Urban Growers. <laughs> and Toronto Urban Growers again, like because it is back in, I believe it was 2018, when Rhonda, <laughs> 
Joe's uh, colleague at uh, came to one of our first food studies classes and inspired so many of the students. They all did their research projects on urban ag and urban growing, interviewed racialized growers from their own communities in Mandarin and Chinese, in Cantonese and Bengali and so on. So those were the seeds that really kind of had led us to do our story. <laughs> I do want to kind of point out the chronology, but also the relationships and connections. And of course, from what you heard from Jackie, and she's shown us how it is really on this building on those connections and those relationships that we felt it was important to actually have the voices and testimonies of the people on the front lines and not just have scholars represent. So that is something I want to start with, and really the gratitude and appreciation for the people who did this. Uh, next slide. So we did a little cloud of just all the different issues that have been covered in the different research stories that have come up from the feeding city lab. And I think there's more now, but this is just a scope. Uh, right. So this is where we started officially within culinary are building on those relationships uh, because Michael Wolfson from the city of Toronto, who you met yesterday, Marina Curello, who's busy organizing the International Public Market Conference, actually again came to UTSC with the folks from Malvern Scarborough to talk about some of these issues in 20... 2016. <laughs> and it is actually four years later when the pandemic happened that feeling helpless as we all did, some of us came together and we actually created this project, Feeding the City, um, which was a public facing project where we began, you know, and you can see the direct connection with what has developed into the shop funded Food Frontlines project because we organized, this is the time when we were actually not allowed <laughs> to do anything in person. It was done on Zoom, and so we had all these different relationships, which were developed further, and that has led to the different types of the public facing, as well as the research insights, uh, and these were you know, more local, so this is kind of a local part. Um, next, uh, so this is just some of the research data we collected with the community engaged uh, networks, and honestly, we are still processing a lot of it because when you're doing the front end and the back end and even with this wonderful and large team of co-leads postdocs that we have it is a lot of work but we remain grateful again for students <laughs> and we have some of them in the room who have really worked with us all the way since 2020 and you know have had the funding from UTSC and SHARP in particular to help us do so so this was one of the surveys this is one of the websites we have community organizations create. And this is again, you know, what we're starting to think of as the kind of food, food sovereignty toolkit. That organizations don't have a capacity. So actually, we were able to <laughs> get our students, led by Noah, <laughs> who brought his expertise from uh, the City Foods International team to create a website which is still functioning and which actually acts as an incubator for racialized entrepreneurs from the marginalized parts of the city. Yes, please. This is, these are the first farmers markets operating in again, the Eastern part of the city where these public markets, farmers markets hadn't been there. And it is again, a black female entrepreneur, Jennifer Ford, when she came to our network in those online meetings, we were able to get our wonderful students and they made the posters, they made the ones, they're still working with her to support the online platform for these markets. We're not able to provide the kind of in-person help because well, we have students scattered all over the city, but it is something and, you know, so it's been three years of a very, very important partnership here. And of course, what we have is that these farmers markets are the venue and that, you know, when we go to the kind of more, uh, outside the city part of the world, you will see that we are called feeding city lab, but really these are the cities and the hinterland, because without farms, <laughs> there isn't food, and without cities, there aren't people to eat the food. <laughs> um, next slide, please. 
So another example of something that, again, because many of these projects started then and we're kind of in this process of, well, it's like letting your children go from the nest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so again, big shout out for <laughs> Noah. We had, of course, our first postdoc, Brian Dale, and then we moved to Noah. And now, of course, we have <laughs> several other postdocs. So what we developed, and it took two long years, <laughs> to actually create an online platform for the Scarborough Food Network, which is, again, TUG is part of the Scarborough Food Network. We, the platform now actually has its first paid coordinator operating out of one of the Scarborough organizations in Asian Court. And so it is a broad grouping where you have anything between 25 to 30 organizations, very, very grassroots organizations, in fact, led and operated by BIFA operationalized uh, stakeholders. And again, it is to one such meeting that Jennifer Ford had come and said, I am as a, as a passion <laughs> without any funding, I'm creating these, you know, grassroots black led farmers markets. Can anyone help? And that's where we were able to use our RAs their skills and their enthusiasm, pay them to do the work because we do not accept volunteers. <laughs> Students get either course credit or they get paid. <laughs> and so this is again the result of it. And we have turned it over to them now, you know, so the baby is out of the nest. And I've been with the farmers markets because we are also moving to the kind of the last stage of these funded projects is that the idea is now we are going to gather the research insight, but also focus on the public facing and the global world. Uh, next slide, please. So this is actually a nice transition activity. So CICS Canada, which uh, operates the SAFE project, the Greenhouse uh, Garden Sustainable Project. So this can took them three years to build those greenhouses because of course of the pandemic dislocations. But it's been amazing and they are producing fresh vegetables, which of course have become are so important in all kinds of ways. So this is really the, the philosophy of from food security to food sovereignty. That in fact is something that it's not just scholars saying, it is the grassroots organizations that they may be running food banks to start with, they're literally feeding people. But their strategy, especially through activities like growing food, respecting the cult ethnocultural uh, traditions and histories and heritage that people bring with them to the cities, <clears throat> connecting back to the countryside, that these are the ways in which what we do at Culinaria informs the lab's activities. Um, and so this is an article that just appeared. If you go to the Feed and the website, go to the external section, the UFT magazine was nice enough to go talk to the community collaborators and carry this. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So uh, everyone, I think, in the room, even in Italy, now knows about Shirk. <laughs> I wish we had a way to tell them, hey, we've given you guys lots of free publicity. <laughs> so we got a so back in 2020 we got a one year grant and I'm happy to say of the 94,000 uh, no was it? yeah 94,000 dollars we were given 98 percent went of it directly to students and two percent went for admin costs. <laughs> Uh, so after that, we were on the quest for funding. So we, this is the project we put forward, and SHERP has uh, something that's the Partnership Development Grant, and the idea is that you develop connections and you also do research. So this is where I'm going to show first. So this is what we were. We were you know, responding to the pandemic, looking at directions, futures beyond. But this is really where we have kind of broadened our scope because you know several of the projects that even my postdocs are doing or that we ourselves are doing are really coming into the broad platform of the lab, but it is also connecting to the um, to the knowledge platform. And the big goal remains to help grassroots stakeholders alleviate food insecurity, work towards food sovereignty, but also to connect. So it is let a hundred flowers bloom, but the hundred flowers should 
bloom in a kind of global garden, which they are. It's just that often they don't know of each other. Uh, next slide, please. So the public facing knowledge dissemination that we have already started with the Feeding the City project continues. Uh, and again, thank you to the team that's been maintaining the website and thank you, Amber, who is going mm -hmm. off on her own project in uh, Rwanda now, but who just did an amazing job training. <laughs> She's not a computer science student, <laughs> trained in WordPress and Drupal and you know helped us um, co-produce under Noah and Joe's supervision, both the SF3 website and the Healing City one. So these are some of the research stories that the students under supervision interviewed, conversed with stakeholders and brought it. Because again, what we have is all this wonderful grassroots activity that's happening and which doesn't get recorded, doesn't get documented. And at the back end, what also happens is we get, I would say a minimum of one request a month, at least, for support letters. And it really helps the organizations. And we have a very good record now <laughs> of grants, everything from the Trillium Foundation to the latest ones that we are writing to the City Foundation and so on, both locally and now globally. The latest one that we've written that we may not get, but actually, if we got it, would allow us to apply this prototype to Lima, Peru, <laughs> uh, Accra, Ghana, and to Scarborough, Canada. So again. What part of what we are doing is to seek to support the organizations because they don't have the time to sit and write about themselves. And that is where we can use the skills of our students with a little bit of supervision to do that. And in the process, the students themselves are showing to the world creativity <laughs> and knowledge application, which are the number one skills that, you know, number one and two skills that employers want, but also teamwork. Because the university is often, you know, I don't need to tell people, it can be a very, very lonely fun. That you're just working on your own and the classroom, often there is the notion that you're competing with your peers rather than collaborating. Um, next slide. So this is the packet that I will say that here, think of <laughs> the student I was in the 1990s going across the city of Delhi, driving two hours to a library because the only copy of the book I needed to read on Renaissance and was there. That is the situation in global summer. Continues to be that way. And of course the payments. And so we have folks from Cairo, uh, from Tamani, from Accra, from um, Colombo, uh, Sri Lanka, and of course, from Canada and the US and so on. But what they're able to access is what a curated, secure SharePoint site of knowledge. And again, that is what our RAs have been putting together. So this is the back end of the show project because yeah, I used to operate a kind of unofficial <laughs> system of sending <coughs> articles and I downloaded to friends and colleagues, but actually you can no longer, and I, that we're not talking about the illegal things. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a better way of doing it. And so I remember a collaborator in Cairo asking, oh, can I share these with my students? And we said, of course, we are legal sharing it with you. And after that, it is up to you to do as you will. And so the latest uh, person is Amy from the Ghana Food Movement who has signed on. The Scarborough Food Network also interestingly just expressed interest and so <laughs> the articles on community gardens and so on which are otherwise paywall because academic knowledge is not made accessible to the public and so this is one of the ways we are uh, funded by SHERP we've been able to use and you can see the scope of the articles there <laughs> this, this little screenshot our next case Oh, sorry, actually, we should go back because I hope you've noted the bread, the cities, and I hope Bologna may be there. <laughs> um, yes, so I wanted to end by talking about, and some of you know that I wrote a book called Empire's Garden, uh, and which was about a region in Eastern India where I was born, and where I wrote about, I didn't actually know food history existed, but I wrote about plantation workers and the racialized um, and complicated ways in which 
you know, they were constructed within the nation making of, of the game India. And, and it is interesting how things operate because when we reached out, uh, next slide please, when we reached out to some of these networks, they were very suspicious of, you know, I could be just anyone, sure, I'm, I was born in India, but I'm in Canada, far away. We haven't met each other. But one of the things that actually helped build trust was that background as a labor scholar. <laughs> and that is where the three wonderful organizations I want to talk about because their actions, their activities, their philosophies match with what you know, so many of you are doing in other parts of the world. So this is a book that has actually documented both from the botanical, the culinary, and the agricultural. <coughs> There's 170 varieties of what in South India is called traditional rice, but which we would know as heirloom uh, and sustainably grown varieties. And so the knowledge has already been produced by these networks, but this is part of, again, this is the public facing side of our actions that we can help them take it further. So that is CIPS, which is the uh, Center for Indian Knowledge Systems. Uh, this other organization, Tamar, is so interesting. So you can see the range of the campaigns. They started with the ban and the salt campaign back in the late 1980s. And I had one of the most moving experiences in my life, sitting in a little room in Kerala, in Tiruvanthapuram, and hearing about how they were inspired by Rachel Corson when they were college students. And they started as environmental activists. They moved on to campaign with Greenpeace and others, engaged in a zero waste campaigns in the Himalayas at the other end of South Asia. But then they realized food was absolutely fundamental to environmental sustainability. And so then they were part of this big um, climate and sustainable agriculture campaign, the Save Rice campaign. They're doing all kinds of activities. But this, uh, they're doing paddy and wetland conservation, but this is the Tanal Trust. And part of, again, the mission, which I hope I can, you know, uh, because they also want us to write their story and tell their story. And it is a kind of compelling story of grassroots environmental activism that typically in, in the global north never hear because it is the kind of same big names that keep appearing, right? And that's where these north, south, south conversations are so important. <coughs> this is again our dream that we can have the folks in Ghana talk directly <coughs> to the folks in India, that we should not have to just continue to be the mediators. Uh, next slide, please. And this is our latest partner from South India. So they have been holding seed festivals over the, you know, the four states of South India, which by the way, basically <laughs> engaged millions of people. They have directly connected to over 100,000 farmers. And the fascinating thing is that this is the Tamil speaking hotland of India connected to Sri Lanka as well, but culture is extremely important. And some of you saw on the Zoom call, uh, Gita Sukumaran, who's our graduate student and my collaborator in this week. And one of the ways in which we build trust, because they already knew Gita because she is a poet, a Tamil poet from Scarborough. And so it was this global networks of creativity as well as sustainability that have kind of come into play. And it's fascinating. And this figure is unknown. And every time I read something about organic agriculture, this is Namalwar, who died in the 2000s, who started as an agriculture officer and you know I kind of tell people he is the Gandhi of sustainable agriculture and Namalwar is a living name still. <coughs> so these are so you know we don't really have much to teach people in the global south. It is up to learn and co-learn and then co-produce together. Uh, next slide. Thank you. And by the way I just wanted to say it is a student from Vic. Cheryl Chung, who was a junior research fellow at the Not for Price Center, who connected with us wanting, she is an Asian student who lives in Scarborough, came to Vic for a lot of reasons, is now actually on a full ride to Oxford for a master's, wanted to give back to her community. And Cheryl first helped us do the interviews in Cantonese and Mandarin with the food bank assistance recipients with CICS. 
volunteered to create this beautiful logo. And so again, it is a collaboration and relationships in many different ways. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. Really wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few minutes for discussion. Well, let me say that uh, it, it is obvious how this this last panel uh, tied perfectly into the, the previous one, especially the last part of the previous one. When the question was, okay, from who studies and now what to do? Uh, and they started talking about action, activism, etc. And here we had a couple of wonderful examples of what we can do as scholars and how politically important can be our, our job. So congratulations, sincere congratulations. And now it's open up the floor, questions, please. Hi, Joy. I wanted to thank you, first of all, for this. This is really wonderful, wonderful work, and it only is going to get better and better. But um, something that you said about Scarborough reminded me that last evening, I was one of the people, I don't know how many of us there were, but we were watching the mayoral debates and the yes. discussions. And Scarborough, of course, came up over and over again. It seems to be the flavor of the month. Um, and I wondered if you knew um, if there were movements to, in fact, invite, entice, inform mm -hmm. the candidates, not only the future winner, but all of the candidates um, about the food insecurity. They were talking about LRT, they were talking about buses, but I didn't hear anything about food. And then I had another follow up question. So we had reached out. Uh, so in fact, that is why our community partner Suman Roy isn't here. He's ISF Cree, one of our two kind of core community partners. He was one of the people. So we tried to organize it from the bottom up, as it were, and then we were told there was already going to be a mayoral debate at the university. So we put them in touch with the Scarborough Food Network. The Scarborough Food Network solicited questions for the last two months and. You know, I was at the symposium, so I didn't listen, but it's very sad if the questions on food insecurity didn't come up. But, but the candidates still have to know about it. The candidates That's... have been given the questions, but yeah. they were, you know, so that is really what happened. But I, there was also the daily bread <laughs> yes. debate. So daily bread is one of the partners in the Scarborough Food Network. So they had the debate at their own. But of course, you can see that there were six candidates and one of the leading candidates did not actually choose to come to the right. <laughs> debate. So right. that is where I think on food policy. And I will say that- shame on who didn't help? Hmm? Who didn't help? Sanders. Sanders. Just the top surprise. Yeah. <laughs> Just put it out there. <laughs> It's, it's interesting too because there are what 140 names for the mayor yeah. on the ballot. So let's hope that it's not going to get lost. <laughs> right. But my follow up question is also something uh, that um, is part of what you're doing uh, the growing and the teaching. What about the cooking? Are you teaching them about cooking? Uh, sometimes the fact that people don't have pots and pans and oil and vinegar holds people back. Is, is, is there something to address that issue as well? Um, so I mentioned a couple of grants we're doing. So again, part of the UFT that I never knew existed, <laughs> it's called Corporate Financial Relations. And they actually reached out to us earlier this year because Citibank has a foundation. And they said to us, there's a global challenge grant on food security. And it's very strange that it actually didn't come to any organization that works on food security. It came to the corporate wing of the university. But I'm very grateful that they actually connected with our own, uh, what used to be called advancement at Scarborough, and they reached out to us. Of course, there was only a week left. But what we did frame, and that is where I learned about the other side of Nino's life. <laughs> and so we wrote a grant. I don't know if we'll get it. But we basically framed it, if we get it, we would be able to actually put money, which is something we don't do right now, right. from Citibank. We granted to four amazing organizations. And what we frame these projects is as youth empowerment, that we would hold something that we've been refining that, and I'm actually we're writing another grant, a smaller one. And what we're thinking of them is a combination of culinary skills and youth empowerment. And so we're doing a small prototype for New College at their request, because they wanted to learn about some of the food sovereignty activities here. 
So now we're calling that a food sovereignty orientation. So there we won't be doing any of the culinary stuff that we're doing in our partners food innovation learning space at 5200 Young. But if all goes well, Culinaria led by Kelsey <laughs> Kilgore's team, and Kelsey is a chef as well as a history PhD <laughs> and a food scholar, is that we have developed this prototype. And I'm happy to say that our wonderful friends at the City of Toronto and Toronto Public Health are absolutely on board. Well, they don't have any money because thanks to the, the policies in the city, but that is why we are writing for these grants. And so what we are developing is what we're calling a kind of combination of food growing, culinary arts, and food consciousness, food sovereignty orientation. Yes. And that's something I would that's love to take to part every part of the university. Yeah, that's marvelous. Thank you for revealing these secrets. <laughs> If I may add just to the, the spirit of this project, you know, which we're you know, collaborating with our culinary people here, especially, uh, is to also like, you know, kind of like, you know, um, change a little bit the supply chains of, uh, of, of foods, uh, at least, well, we're, we're trying to like integrate it, how to do it here in France as well, which is like, you know, larger uh, metropoly. Uh, but uh, in Lima and Accra, we're trying to, uh, you know, just think really about ways in which you can grab good organic um, foods that are going to waste and put it in the hands of the people that will uh, be part of these programs. I think has a program like that. So um, we're, we're trying to like change the, you know, see how we can interview these questions in the city so that we can make that happen, right? So that's a big component to both avoid food waste, but also to like make really good quality ingredients which are available to, you know, these locations for these specific populations that are but particularly good, right? So. What is Sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to also play devil's advocate here because I was summoned by the administration, as we often are, to talk to a group of, they said it was residents from Scarborough. Unfortunately, it wasn't, it was what I would call representatives of NIMBYism. And who put, put what I would call the very classist view, they were like, oh, you need to teach those people how to cook because they're wasting food. And I was like, you know what? I'm sorry. <laughs> they don't actually have food to cook. They can't afford those food. And they don't have the pots and no. pans. Yeah, no, and also uh, there's a wonderful organization, Access Alliance, did a, and they do their own research. And they're like, yeah, our residents are well aware of the importance of, you know, free range and organic and sustainably produced foods. They just can't afford them. So yes, so it's absolutely important. And this is where, again, we can learn from the global south. But in the kind of current inequitable industrial food system that prevails here, including at this university. You know, we need to be mindful of the barriers that are systemic, not just of knowledge. And yes, I absolutely do not, you know, so in culinaria, when we teach our classes, we do hope that our students will learn to cook. We don't teach them necessarily how to cook. And that, so it is important to bring those culinary arts, but it is something that has been there all the way from, you know, the settlement agencies of the turn of the century, where your American social workers went to Italians and said, well, we'll teach you how to cook because you're eating the wrong thing, you're eating tomatoes and vegetables. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Just yes. Uh, on the theme of learning from the global south, you know, it would be really special, I think, if we won this this grant um, because the work that the organization would be re-granting to in Peru is like we can all learn from them. They're they're taking food directly from agroecology ecological farmers and feeding people with it, which transforms uh, is a direct resistance to sort of global ag. And the one thing that we can learn from and then in Ghana, the they're where we'd be supporting an organization that does school feeding, which we which we are trying to initiate in Ontario, and they're working towards how can because the school feeding program in Ghana has its own challenges, including around the quality of food, and so there we want to experiment with how to make that food more delicious, more local, 
um, more nutritious, um, but also accessible. But it people. needs to exist. And so it again, exists. And here yeah. in the it really flips the sort of north south yeah. divide and the yeah. local global. So I, it would be um, a sincere act, like, effort to learn and share practice examples. So midday meals have been transformative for decades. And of course, you know, in India, where the right wing government is now, of course, trying to phase out eggs, which are the only source of protein. But they have been transformative. And so it's one of the ironies of history that Canada is the only G7 country that does not have. So the Coalition for Healthy School Foods, led by Debbie Field, formerly of Food Share, is one of our consistent partners. I think they and Tug have been with us. So literally, when I saw the call in 2020, thanks to the relationship, I got Rhonda on the phone from Tug. <laughs> then I got Debbie on the phone and I said, Will you support us? Because literally, we had to work it around the week. And similarly, the minute, you know, I reached out to Sierra and, you know, Sierra <laughs> got on her social media with the Ghana Food Movement people and, you know, reached out to the folks in Lima. So that's where I think these human relationships really need to inform. Uh, and I mean, food is about love. Food is about sharing. And I think that is something which perhaps, <laughs> you know, and I think the humanities and the social science and the natural science is all equally at fault that we may be a lab, but be a lab of human beings. I wanted to reach out to actually Mohini. Are you able to show your face? <laughs> so Mohini is at Uppsala University. She is one of the many people who tried to join culinary as a grad student and thanks to the terrible admission policies of the UFT did not manage to do so. She went to Uppsala University. Then she found out that there is actually the International Collaborative Student Program. She worked as an RA with the Feeding City Lab last year with SF3 as well. She helped us with the Small Food Enterprise, the Restaurant Outreach Project we did with the City of Toronto and Scarborough. And uh, in her own right, she's also a culinary consultant, has worked with chefs in Goa most recently while she did a food, her uh, field work. She's a sociology student, PhD student at Uppsala, and she worked with Dalits, the most marginalized section of the population on a food project in North India. And we're hoping Mohini can come back to the lab. But again, this is where we really would love to have you know, students from Bologna and beyond come to us in different capacities. Because sadly, one of the biggest challenges for us is that we have wonderful students like Janita, the grad students, and Mike over there. But the way the university is structured, it's actually very, very hard to integrate their work without making undue demands on them since they have PhDs finished. So that again is one of the systemic barriers. And with the help of folks like <laughs> Professor Isaac here, we are hoping to actually pitch. And I see Steve is still here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve Estabrook is the director of the new School of the Environment, and you heard Michael Classen's from there. And one of the things I'll say, and it's not a secret to the people here, maybe I shouldn't wash our dirty linen, but ironically, you've seen all this we've done. We are actually people without a home. We are scholars who are actually looking for department that will respect and encourage and I told you, you have to, I'm not applying for another academic grant because it is thanks to Marnie's department, which agreed to house our last grant because I was told that my department did not have capacity or interest to house it. So that is the other issue. That in a way, the traditional disciplines have become gatekeepers. And so when we try to work in interdisciplinary ways, mount this kind of dialogue and actually attract students back to the disciplines as well as to the school work, that is where the gatekeepers and the barriers come in. Mm -hmm. So just as our communities face systemic barriers, I would say that, you know, but this is where I'm really encouraged by all of you who've come here. And I would say that we are also here at VIC because Victoria College and of course the provost <laughs> Our pick is Nick Saul, who is one of the most innovative thinkers and practitioners of food justice in Canada, the founder of community food centers and of the staff. And we are looking to Trinity to Vic and to our friends at Trinity. I think Nicole is there. 
I had a, I was there for an exciting presentation from the Lawson Center of Sustainability yesterday. And so we are really looking to build those alliances and to continue to get wonderful students from there. Okay, sorry, I should stop talking. <laughs> Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, thank you all. Yeah, we have the lunch now. Something else? Help me. We go and eat. I think we thank everyone and eat and talk. Okay. <laughs> lunch is just outside. Yeah. And then do we